Hey, good afternoon. It got quiet, so I guess we'll start the meeting. Uh, welcome to our afternoon meeting for October 26th, 2021. Um, could you please join us in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, if you're able? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, today's invocation will be provided by the District 9 star recipients, I'm told. So Councilmember Foley is here to tell us more. I think we have a mic issue. Let's hang on just one moment. We're gonna get that on for you. Go. Oh. That works. Okay. This is a bit of departure from the normal invocation that we have every, every meeting but it's my last meeting uh, in, no in October and I'd like to award the District 9 stars. District 9 stars are a uh, rec recognition by people who are doing good work in the community. The only criteria, they have to be a District 9 resident and they have to be nominated by someone else. So today I have three individuals and groups who have been nominated by their loved ones, by their community members, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. But first I wanna continue telling you a little bit about the D9 Star. This Star Award was presented initially by my predecessor two council members ago, Judy Cherko. Every year she would present a District 9 Star. The, I've taken over this exciting opportunity to be able to recognize people who are doing kindness, spreading generosity throughout our community. And you're gonna hear about them in just a minute. It's my pleasure really to, and my teams, to look at all the nominations we receive and then narrow them down to three every year. It's actually a pretty difficult challenge because we have so many wonderful people who are, and organizations who are doing such good work. So today, I'm going to highlight three of them. The first is the South Valley Fish Food Pantry. They were nominated by Kathy Myers, and today we are joined by Amy Sapp, Melanie Adkins, Tracy Ganatra, and Ann Christian. And also Dave Myers, I'm sorry, standing in for Kathy who would, couldn't make it today. For the past five years, the organization has spent every Thursday afternoon providing free meals and groceries to those in need in the Cambrian area. They provide holiday meals three times a year and backpacks for children returning to school. Thanks to coordination with Second Harvard Food Bank, generous monetary donations, and the hard work and compassion of their 80 plus volunteers of all ages, they're able to serve approximately 45 families per week. Organization was, this organization was functioning in a time when their services to minimize food insecurity were needed the most feeding 2,073 families in 2020. They go above and beyond to be accommodating and kind to all their, their clients. They oper out of, operate out of St. Timothy's Church in Ca the Cambrian area. I am commending the South Valley Fish Food Pantry, Pantry for their admirable leadership in the Cambrian community, ensuring that individuals and families in need are able to be fed and nourished warmly welcoming those of all ages as volunteers and making their services as accept accessible as possible. Please join me in thanking them for their work. And I will say that in the past, we've been able to give a commendation and a chocolate star, but we can't give a chocolate star anymore. The vendor's out of business and we couldn't find them, so instead, instead we're giving them a buntini. <laughs> so sorry I don't have a chocolate, but for this group it'd be, it's easier to split up a buntini. <laughs> With that, yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, I'd like to recognize Vicki Bowes Mock and HB Mock. And what's really exciting is that remember last week for the invocation, I had Karen Adamski do an invocation. Karen was one of my first D9 star recipients, and she nominated HB and Vicki. So I'm excited to reciprocate, and or she was excited to reciprocate. Nominated by Karen uh, Adamski, as I just mentioned, and what they bring is they add beauty to the neighbors, neighborhood through painted rocks that are placed under the tree in front of their home and contributions to the art box, pro art box project. I heard that HB makes the best Snoopy rocks. I want one because Snoopy rocks. <laughs> Both volunteer time and talent through the Happy Hollow Foundation, Vicki's a board member, HB is building a chicken coop to enhance Happy Hollow Park and Zoo. Vicki demonstrates her belief in the power of community through starting the nonprofit group Compass Collective, where she plants the seed and shows how easy it is to, to get involved and give back. She published a field guide to community service, where to go for community activism, getting kids involved, social services, art, and more. And here's the book, it's quite extensive. Field Guide 2.0, there must be a 1.0. They host Front Yard Fridays, their way of bringing neighbors together to meet each other and grow as a community. I thank them for being such a wonderful team who spreads joy and finds meaningful ways to bring the community together. Thank you for all that you do. Please join the, me in thanking them. Latha, please come forward. Latha Santosh is, was nominated by Shraddha Santosh, her daughter. Unfortunately, her daughter's not here, but you're, I believe you're her son. Welcome. You, mu you obviously know you have a wonderful mom. When Latha and her family moved to the Cambria neighborhood in 2000, they were one of five Indian families living in the area. Today, there are over 600. Wonderful role models who pours her heart heart out into organizing social events that seek to bond all Indians within the area and allows them to celebrate their roots, Diwali and Mendy Night as examples. She has created numerous fundraisers for local organizations such as the Humane Society and Lee High School. She provides support to the younger generation in her community through kickstarting events such as Camp Sapne, Big Brother and Sister, and doggy love, that sounds like fun. She is passionate and about sustainable living, volunteer time in installing compost bins in 57 homes, as well as at Oster Elementary School. She prepared compost starter ingredients to ensure each home is successful in their journey. Their family does their part as well by adding more color and vibrancy to their home through contributions to the art box. Today I'm honoring Latha for being a natural born leader, a jack of all trades, and for taking a hands-on approach to making a difference within the Cambrian community and beyond. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking her. Thank you so much. So concludes my District 9 star presentation. There are so many more people and organizations that I could have awarded, but for now, these are the three. I'll see you next year when I have three more. Thank you for all the work that you do. All right. Thank you to our District 9 stars for all you do for our community. And we're going to go find some chocolate stars. We know them out there. All right, uh, let's go to ceremonial items before we jump into our agenda. First, we'll start uh, with Councilmember Carrasco. Uh, 
she is going to help us proclaim Filipino American History Month. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Magdalena Carrasco, and I represent the beautiful east side of San Jose, home to many Filipino Americans here in the city of San Jose. October is Filipino American History Month. October was chosen as it marks the first documented landing of Filipinos in what is now known as the continental U.S. This was on October 18th, 1587. This month is meant to highlight and educate on those legacies created by our Phil Am community. Since 2009, October has been designated as Filipino American History Month. The Filipino American community includes a rich history in both the Philippines and throughout the United States, sharing with us their fierce advocacy and organization, diverse traditions, incredible dishes, and their intense sense of justice aiding during war efforts and now against COVID-19 virus. There exists, there exists such a broad spectrum of Filipino trailblazers uh, to reference. You've got labor leaders like Larry Leong, who would have been 108 yesterday. Philip Veracruz, whose leadership sparked the Delano Grape uh, boycott strike. Actors and celebrities like Vanessa Hudgens, Alec Mapa, drag queen Manila Luzon, and Bretman Rock, who bring Phil Am representation to our screens. Singers like the mega-talented Bruno Mars. That was surprising. <laughs> Olivia Rodrigo, who reigned the charts, and our very own Attorney General Rob Bonta, who prior to being AG was the first Filipino-American to enter the California State Legislature. Icons that have cemented the Phil Am talent, the Phil Am spirit into the great tapestry of our country. Our country and region owe the Filipino American community a great debt of gratitude. It was, labor, it was those labor leaders like Larry and Phil Veracruz who played a pivotal role in the labor strikes and grape boycotts as they organized groups of Filipinos to strike against the grape growers of Delano, California, alongside Mexican American leaders such as Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, thus beginning a collaboration between Filipinos, Mexicanos, Chicanos, and other ethnic groups that would go on for years. I'm incredibly proud that we as a city have enshrined the great legacy of the naming of one of our newest parks as Delano Manong's Park, the only park, by the way, to bear homage to the Filipino community. This gem of a park will sit squarely at the north end of District 5, serving as a beacon for the Phil Am community. And I would be remiss if I didn't shine a light on our unspoken heroes, those Phil Am nurses who selflessly helped our community, especially in those areas that were hardest hit, the east side being one of them. Oftentimes during the pandemic, we saw beautiful, heartwarming interviews dedicated to the struggles of our nurses and healthcare staff, but rarely did we see the many Filipino faces. According to UCSF in California, a little over 20% of registered nurses are of Filipino descent. We recognize your sacrifice, we mourn what you have lost, and we profusely thank you for your service. The diversity of San Jose runs wide and deep. We have more commonalities than we have differences. As a Mexicana, our bond is established, bound by Spanish colonization. I turn to our Phil Am community as a sister with a common understanding of our history. We share in traditions, faith, and even language. It's my pleasure to have with me today, to have with us today, Trustee Delma Boak, Dr. Rowena Tomanenga, 
Ron Muriera, and Dr. Angelica Cortez. I'd like to ask, uh, oh, I, let me just mention, I just wanna mention that Dr. Uh, uh, Angelica Cortez from Lead Filipino is an unbelievable organization here in the city of San Jose. Since 2015, Lead Filipino has provided critical services and programs to educate and uplift the leadership of Filipinos in the community. Lead works arduously with hundreds of students and their families through educational programs to provide technical assistance and distribute thousands of dollars in financial assistance to low-income community members. I'm extremely grateful for their presence and their collaboration and the support that they uh, provide for our families. I'd like to formally invite you to all join me and lead Filipino at our Filipino flag raising event this Thursday from six to eight here at City Hall. Come enjoy a beautiful night of culture, of tradition, and of course, good food. I also encourage you to check out Lead Filipino series of events. They are keeping busy making sure that our Phil Am community is being properly represented and taken care of. And now I'd like to ask the mayor to please present the proclamation. And I'm going to have Ron say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Carrasco, for being uh, such an amazing supporter of the Filipino-American community here in San Jose. So on behalf of the Filipino, Filipina, Filipinex community in San Jose, deepest thanks to Council Member Carrasco for her continued support of our community, Mayor Licardo and Council Members for recognizing and acknowledging October as Filipino-American History Month, established by the Filipino-American National Historical Society in 1991, and thereafter recognized through resolutions passed by the California State Legislature, the U.S. Congress, various secondary and post-secondary institutions, and for the first time in 2015, acknowledgement by President Barack Obama in the nation. Thank you for your continued commitment towards recognizing the value, significant con contributions that Filipino, Filipina, Filipinx Americans make to San Jose. As the council member said, it's also a milestone this year for San Jose as we have the naming of Delano Manongs Park in San Jose, East San Jose, to be specifically uh, regionally and territorially uh, correct. <laughs> East San Jose, yeah. <laughs> dedicated to the Filipino Manongs who organized and led the 1965 Delano Grape Strike. So Filipino American History Month this year, theme is 50 years of Filipino American movement. Far West Conference 50 years ago was established by young Filipino American organizers and student activists and to this day, we continue with Lead Filipino of the cultivation of young Filipino American organizers, activists, educators, which is integral to all our communities. So this month is about, not just about accomplishments and achievements of our past pioneers, but bringing awareness and celebrating the Filipino, Filipino, Filipinex Americans who are making history now. Angelica is one of them. And our pioneers, Thelma Boak, Dr. Tomaneng. Finally, I'd like to recognize, as Council Member Carrasco has said, and honor our courageous Filipino, Filipino, Filipinex medical and healthcare workers who have been on the front lines combating the COVID-19 pandemic in San Jose, Santa Clara County, and throughout the nation. Many have made the ultimate sacrifice with their lives to care for those afflicted by this dire pandemic. To them, we are forever grateful. Thank you so much for your acknowledgement of Filipino American History Month. Mabuhay. Okay, uh, we don't often do this, although I suppose we should be doing this more, but we're honoring the departure of one of our long-serving commissioners, and that is Vincent Seri. So Vince, could you please come down?
Council Member Foley, I know, is going to join me up here, because I believe you're one of the great D9 residents, about which she's so proud. And uh, welcome, Vince. So in addition to the many ways in which, uh, I'm going to take this off, if that's all right, for the purpose of speaking. In addition to the many ways in which Vince serves our community uh, as a board member at Via Services, I know you've been very active in Rotary. I think you lead an effort with nearly 100 high school students uh, every year at Silomara Leadership Camp. I actually went to that when I was a little kid. Actually, I wasn't so little, but anyway, uh, that was a fantastic experience, and I can't believe you're doing it because that's an incredible amount of patience. Uh, but speaking of patience, uh, Vince has endured uh, almost as many public meetings as Councilmember Foley and I have. Um, he is stepping down as a trustee of the Police and Fire Retirement Board after almost 11 years of service, uh, beginning in 2010. And that's particularly relevant because, uh, both because of the quality of Vince's service and leadership, as well as the time in which came in was so critical. Um, Vince was a longtime chair of our investment committee at a critical moment when we were just beginning to learn about some of the very serious, serious challenges that our retirement funds faced around very large unfunded liabilities, uh, stretching into the billions of dollars, and a desperate need for greater professionalism in our investment decision making. And Vince hit the ground running and in 2010 really charged ahead making sure that we had a much more responsible approach to investment, uh, something that focused, uh, really enhanced a focus on risk management, which is something we really didn't have uh, prior to that time. And these are the kinds of changes and this is the kind of effort and leadership that doesn't get noticed uh, by our residents, but it has huge impacts if we think about the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that really are in the balance and our retirees depend on those dollars. And if they're not there for our retirees, it means it gets cut from our services uh, that our residents so critically uh, deserve and need. And so we really wanted to honor Vince uh, for coming in in really a difficult time in this city in 2010 when uh, I think we all recognized this was a part of our city that was in crisis and frankly retirement services at that moment was pulling the rest of our city into crisis. And I was, remember the closed session discussions around uh, do we consider bankruptcy or not? Those are the kinds of very stark realities we're facing around the time of the Great Recession thereafter because we're seeing these enormous unfunded liabilities and trying to figure out how do we pull out of this. Uh, so we are grateful for all of Vince's leadership in helping us to right this ship uh, and uh, grateful also for Roberto Pena and the other Members of the the, uh, the trustee the uh, board who are here uh, to cheer on Vince, thank you for for cheering on a colleague. Uh, and I think I've said enough. Councilmember Foley, did you want to say anything more? <laughs> Can I cover a couple other? Okay, things? sure. Jump on in. Can I hand you that though for a moment? So I've had the privilege to know Vince for almost 20 years, I think, through our mutual involvement through the Rotary Club's Enterprise Leadership Conference. Vince has been a mentor to 100 children, high school juniors every year since about then, and he and I were team partners mentoring these students together. I'm proud to also call Vince one of my mentors. He is a, a tireless advocate of doing the right thing. He's been involved in VIA services, which helps uh, disabled children, they have camps. He's been involved in that for years. This is a man who never says no to volunteering. He's only stepping down because of a business conflict. That's it. It's not because he wants to. I'm sure he would continue to stay on the board, but I know his services will be beneficial elsewhere. I know there will be some organization, some student, some family, some group who will truly benefit from his involvement. And I'm just so honored and proud to know you, to call you my friend and mentor. You're a wonderful man, Vince Sanceri. I'm. It's my privilege. Can I give you a hug? Yeah, just a few words. I mean, really, I want to thank the, the council, the mayor, 
city manager, city attorney for the leadership in this city. It's really critical and important, and we really value it as um, citizens of San Jose. I'm a native San Josean, so I really appreciate that. The leadership on the police and fire and federated board, our CEO, Roberto Pena, our CIO, Prabhu Palani. We have the police and fire board chair, Drew Lanza, and vice chair, Andrew Gardner here. Um, really, the board came together over the last 10 years, worked diligently to help reduce the unfunded liability. It's an incredible group of volunteers as board members that I'm really proud to have been a part of it. Thank you. should tell you, as a former plan board member, those are long meetings, so thank you. <laughs> it's a lot of time and commitment. Council Member Esparza, join, uh, please join me. We're going to recognize and commend Steve O'Brien and Sage Hopkins. Welcome. Very, very high. Thank you. Today, I'm so honored to present a commendation to Steve O'Brien and to Sage Hopkins, recognizing their courageous actions to shine a light on sexual abuse and ensure that the voices of survivors were heard and amplified. Steve O'Brien joined San Jose State Athletics in 2017 as deputy director having already earned a national reputation as an athletics administrator. Originally an attorney, Steve began his career in intercollegiate athletics at Santa Clara University in 2006, his alma mater, as an assistant athletics director. He then served as the associate athletics director for development at UC Santa Barbara before spending six years as senior associate athletics director at the US Naval Academy in Annapolis. He has also served on the NCAA's Committee on Sportsmanship and Ethical Conduct. Sage Hopkins has served as head coach of the women's swim and diving team at San Jose State for 16 seasons, including several of their best seasons ever, and has twice been honored as the Western Athletic Conference's Women's Swimming Coach of the Year. After becoming aware of disturbing allegations of sexual abuse by a trainer within the athletics department, Sage Hopkins began reporting these allegations to the university administration as far back as 2009 and was met with resistance that lasted over a decade. But Sage continued to bring these allegations to light, including reporting to the NCAA and now separate Title IX investigations as well as a federal investigation, have determined that the allegations are accurate and truthful. However, Sage's efforts in bringing this abuse to light were not welcomed, and as deputy director, Steve was tasked with disciplining the swim coach, which he refused to do. He was fired shortly thereafter. Coaches and all those who serve as leaders for our student athletes have a profound responsibility for the well-being of their athletes. This is a sacred mantle that transcends a mere job title. This is true leadership, taking personal and professional responsibility for those you serve. When our institutions fail to protect those they are supposed to serve, when those in positions of power turn a blind eye to abuses, it falls on a brave few who are willing to put their professional livelihood on the line to serve as whistleblowers and to protect those whistleblowers when needed. This requires steadfast courage and conviction, and it requires a willingness to sacrifice one's own professional and personal comfort and safety for the good of others. Steve O'Brien and Sage Hopkins both prioritize the safety of their student athletes at great professional cost to themselves because they knew it was the right thing to do. 
their actions in bringing to light serial misconduct of another member of the athletics department allowed the voices of numerous survivors of that abuse to be heard and saved untold numbers of athletes from future abuse. Steve O'Brien and Sage Hopkins, for your courage and conviction in standing up for the survivors of sexual abuse, we are so honored to present this commendation to you from the city of San Jose. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you. I'll take this off hoping that I, I don't have to speak on this account again. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Council Member Esparza, Mayor Licardo, and the other members of the San Jose City Council. Although underlying this commendation is the sadness of suffering of others and dismay that the actions that Coach Hopkins and I took should be so uncommon as to warrant public recognition. It's humbling, though, to receive a civic commendation from the city in which I was born and raised. I'm deeply moved by this acknowledgement. I'm here today with my wife, Julianne, and the oldest of our two sons. It's in everyone's best interest that our younger son remain at daycare for nap time today. <laughs> I want to thank all of them as they, too, endured the disruption to our life and the economic hardship associated with job loss and my ouster from the college athletics industry at the outset of the pandemic. More importantly, I want to thank Julianne for reminding me that no job, title, or even career is worth compromising one's integrity over. And I want to thank our boys for being an ever-present inspiration to set a positive example and then do the right thing, not only regardless of adverse consequences, but sometimes in the sheer face of them. To the student athletes, I'm incredibly sorry for the abuse you suffered and the uphill battle you faced to remedy and end the situation. I applaud your courage and resilience throughout the ordeal. You're a source of strength for many, and I wish you the same in your own personal journeys of healing and recovery moving forward. And finally, I'd like to express gratitude and congratulations to Sage Hopkin, who for over a decade tirelessly pursued justice for these victims and tried to protect other student athletes. You're a testament to the collegiate coaching profession, and it's a privilege to share this stage with you today. Thank you again for this commendation. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Council Member Esparza, Mayor Licardo. This is a humbling honor, and I'd like to start off by expressing my gratitude and love for my wife, Tammy, and my children, Gunner and Summer. This has been a very difficult period of time, and I would be remiss for not acknowledging the impact on my family and how tough it's been for them. Words cannot express the strength you have provided me and the comfort you have given me, especially over these past two years. I'd also like to express my gratitude for the dynamic and visionary leadership of our new athletics director, Jeff Konya, and I'm excited to be part of his vision for the new era of San Jose State Athletics. I would also, I also feel it's important to thank two other people, Tracy Sagawa, our former Title IX director, for her assistance in bringing justice to this situation, as well as my former assistant, Whitney Jorgensen, for her assistance in the various reporting over the last two years. As I've said, this is not and should not be about me. Our thoughts, empathy, and passion should be with the dozens of survivors from six separate teams at San Jose State. And our focus should be on their healing. While this represents an ugly chapter in the history of San Jose State, I ask that people view it for what it is. This is the actions of a serial predator and a small group of rogue administrators who enabled his abuse over a 10 plus year period. None of these people represent our university for what it truly is, a vibrant, diverse, and transformational campus that is led by a world-class faculty and blessed with an amazing student body. 
Steve, I'd also like to thank you for your courage, and it's something we should see a lot more of everywhere, but especially in intercollegiate athletics. Again, thank you, Council Member Esparza, Mayor Licardo. All right, on to the, uh, the agenda. Uh, on orders of the day, does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Uh, I have, understand, under item 2.16, uh, that could be added under orders of the day, but that requires a two-thirds vote. That's the amendment to the master agreement with Smart Wave Technologies, the Eastside Union High School District uh, Community Wi-Fi. And then a uh, new item, the last item, 2.16, that was amended for this, for addition. There's a new item as well, 2.20, that's a redistricting commission appointment, uh, also be added under orders of the day that also requires a two-thirds vote. So that's what we have. Are there any other changes? No, I'll make the motion to add the two under orders of the day. Second. Thank second. you. There's a motion from Councilmember as far as a second, Councilmember Carrasco. Let's vote. Yes. Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, we're on to the closed session report, Nora. Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. Thank you. Uh, next is the consent calendar. Are there any items the council would like to pull? I have one request from Councilmember Perales on 2.15, which is the Warm Springs Quiet Zone. Uh, are there other items to pull? And I'm not looking at my Zoom screen, so I'll ask Tony if she sees any hands from our council. I'll there, get on Zoom right away. There are no hands. Okay, thanks for the help, Tony. Okay, uh, then let's go first to 2.15, which is the Warm Springs Quiet Zone. I want to thank Councilmember Perales for his efforts, uh, leadership on this, as well as our Department of Transportation. This has been a, a very hard challenge, and it seems like we're making some, some great progress with the help of uh, Congresswoman Lofgren and, and many others. Thank you, Mayor. I, I don't know if we have anybody in the public that's wishing to speak on this item on Zoom. If not, I'll only give my comment. We do? Or we don't? I'm seeing yes or no. <laughs> I, I have one member of the public with a hand up. I don't know if that's for this item or all of consent calendar. Oh, got it. Maybe we can go to them then all. all. Okay, let's hear from members of the public. Blair Beekman. Hi, I'm Blair Beekman here. I wanted to speak on uh, the remaining consent calendar items, but to quickly add a comment, uh, good luck what you can do with this issue. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. okay, so that was just on 215, so we'll go back to Councilmember Prowls. Thank you, Mayor. And, uh, and thank you, too, as well, to, uh, to you, Mayor, and, and your staff uh, for being there to support on this issue. Um, this really uh, has, has been an issue over the last number of years, uh, came about actually in a shift from Union Pacific Railroad's operations back in 2019. 
uh, traditionally were running daytime trains um, and, and didn't really have too many trains that would run overnight. And they had a shift in operations at that point. Um, and since early 2019, have been running multiple trains throughout the middle of the night. And unfortunately, as they're crossing over every single intersection through what is a very slow moving corridor for them, uh, they're, they're required to uh, blare their horn uh, in a, sequ a sequential pattern uh, at a very loud level. And we have quite a bit of residents uh, in and around um, in the area there. And, and in fact, you can hear it blocks away. I imagine even the mayor hears it. Um, and so it, it, is, it has been really, really troubling for our community members in and around um, the, the core of downtown. And uh, as, as soon as the issue came about, um, my office and the mayor's office as well got engaged to try to see what we could do. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the, the best opportunity was a quiet zone. But that, as we knew at that point, was gonna be very costly and very time consuming, hence, uh, I think why I'm excited and why I pulled it off consent today because uh, we have now come to a, a, a great um, point in, uh, in this process. And uh, even though our community members have really endured a lot of, uh, of, of trauma uh, and disturbance throughout the last number of years, especially this last year and a half with the pandemic with so many people working from home, um, this is a milestone that we're really excited about and uh, looking forward to, to being able to, to move forward with it um, and, and continue the effort. I wanna say thank you as well to Assemblymember Calra and Senator Cal, uh, Cortez's offices. Uh, the state came through with $8 million uh, of support uh, this past year. We had uh, Congresswoman Lofgren's office uh, who was attempting to get some federal funds as well that, that uh, unfortunately did not come through, but she's been a, a great advocate helping us out through the process and Supervisor Chavez's office as well. Uh, it's, it's really been, a team effort, um, but it has been our city DOT staff that has really carried the water for, for all of us. And so I just wanna say thank you for your work over the last couple of years, John Risto, uh, Alisar, Aoun, Stacy Liu, Jessica Zank, uh, and the entire DOT team for your efforts um, in, in persistence in working diligently alongside uh, the Federal Rail uh, uh, Authority, UPRR and the CPUC. This has absolutely been a true partnership to try to get to, to this point and, uh, and then lastly, we've had some community members uh, that have really been there for us, Jason Muring and Christopher Wimp, uh, that have been uh, fierce advocates and, and been with us through the process to help and educate the community. And so I just wanna say thank you to them as well. This resolution today is gonna start uh, the work that our community has been so desperately waiting for. Um, and, and just wanna say thanks uh, to everybody for, for your efforts. Uh, and with that, I'll move approval of uh, 2.15. Second. Thank you, Councilman Wright. I neglected to thank uh, Senator Cortez and uh, Assembly Member Cara for that state uh, funding, which was really critical. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, thanks also to John Risto and Jessica Zank and everybody who worked so hard on this. Okay, uh, we now have, I believe that motion included I, I all could, the- I'll include the rest of the consent calendar as well, sorry. Good call, thank you. Is that okay with the seconder? Great. Uh, Let's go to the public, Mr. Beekman. I'm sorry, Tony, it's your job. I just took over. Hi, thank, thank you that you acknowledged uh, remaining consent calendar items for public comment time. Thank you. Um, I wanted to speak about, uh, there is the um, extension of, of uh, the hybrid meeting process through November. Um, well, I've been trying my best to, uh, you know, really hope that we, We'll be considering like the use of mask use uh, this fall and into through holiday time. It's been reported, you know, COVID numbers are rising in England and, and Russia. That is usually always a sign that in the next month or so, it will start be, to be rising here again, and we're going to be starting to worry. And uh, so, you know, mask use will be important, and we'll, we, will, we will be addressing issues of uh, vaccination process with with young people and uh by january just to be aware of those things i think it's important we have good practices now and and then the learning to talk about our technology policies openly i think can really help create a good conversation for all of us and all of us can can have a place to work from and, and consider issues thank you um with my remaining time 
uh, with the smart wave technology, there's also some uh, uh, bringing a new mobility plans to downtown San Jose. Uh, um, you know, th th they're connected in the ways that these are, these are they'll be using Wi-Fi technology that will have surveillance and, and data collection involved. So, you know, our digital equity future has to be considering open public policies for all of these things and how can it be, how can these things work together towards our better future? It's always important to say open public policies in the future of our, our digital equity future. So thank you. Um, and for the redistricting things, I really, really like the ideas of uh, item 3C and, and, and districts moving east to west. And we can really work on how that can work for all. Back, back to the chair. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Let's, Let's vote, vote now, now on the consent calendar. Yes. Yes. Aye. Aye. Yes. Yes. Aye. 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 Why oh, it's musical? Okay. Um, <laughs> we're on to uh, the land use consent calendar, which is ten point one. Is there a motion? So moved. This is for those who are at home watching. This is the Mills Act contract for property located on Magnolia Avenue. Is there a public comment on this item, Tony? Okay, let's vote on the motion. Yes. Yes. Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Okay, we're rolling now. We're on to the report of the city manager, item 3.1. Jennifer? Yes, um, we do have an, a COVID-19 update today. I'd like to turn it over to Lee Wilcox, assistant city manager, and Dolan Beckel, interim deputy city manager, and the team to provide you that update. Very good. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Community Members, Lee Wilcox, Assistant City Manager. Joining me in the box today is Dolan Beckel, our Interim Deputy City Manager and Operations Chief of the Emergency Operations Center, as well as uh, Carolina Camarena, the City's Communications Director and our EPIO. And last but not least, Alvin Galang, Assistant to the City Manager and our lead of our Vaccination Task Force. There we go. Uh, consistent with the last few uh, COVID updates um, from city staff, we're gonna keep it focused on a limited number of items. So they have the opportunity to discuss those with you. And these are gonna focus on data, trends that we see with COVID-19 uh, throughout the world, country, and locally. And then for today, we'll be jumping into kids vaccinations, boosters, and the new guidance on indoor masking that was released by the County of Santa Clara, as well as other Bay Area counties. And the next part of our presentation will be given by Dolan. Thanks, Lee. So good afternoon again, honorable mayor, council members, members of the public and city staff, Dolan Beckel, deputy city manager, interim deputy city manager here to present the trends in COVID-19 since our last update on September 25th. Um, the Delta variant, the most serious variant, uh, remains highly transmissible through most of the United States as seen in the red shading on the Center for D Disease Control or CDC map uh, and remains the dominant variant in the United States. There are no variants of interest at this time as the Mu variant has shown not to be a concern to the CDC. There is a Delta offshoot uh, variant called AY4.2 that is getting some attention internationally, but it is not a concern here by the CDC at this time. As shown in the circle, the Bay Area counties are faring better while some Bay Area, Bay Area counties are in the moderate or yellow transmission rate, 
Santa Clara County is just slightly into the substantial or orange transmissions rate still. The overall national vaccination rate has moved up slightly for ages 12 plus at least one dose from 75.1 to 77.2. Uh, moving on to um, data at the county level, the county positive cases have flattened out. They have not returned to the levels of single or low double digit we saw before the rise of the Delta variant. Deaths per week do continue to decrease. Two of the primary indicators of the stability of the public health system are one, hospitalizations, and two, the intensive care or ICU bed availability. Hospitalizations have moved up slightly, and the number of available ICU beds has decreased 21% from our last report. And while the ICU beds have decreased, it should be noted the availability is trending up and down in a fairly narrow range, as this graph shows. Also in the graph uh, shows the peak availability of ICU beds at the start of the pandemic, and it should be noted the county does not have a large contingency should a more uh, serious variant arise during the winter months, uh, requiring a major surge in ICU bed availability. Since our last update, both the county and city vaccination rates have increased slightly uh, when the denominator is ages 12 and above at least one dose. So the city's vaccination rate has moved up from 92.5 to 94, or 1.5% increase, and the county's vaccination rate has moved from 88.4 to 89.6, or a 1.2% increase. And later on today, Alvin will talk about our continued commitment to the ongoing vaccination drive. Um, with the updated guidance on indoor masking guidelines that I'm gonna address later, and the authorization of vaccine for kids age five to 11 imminent we will likely not show these measures and metrics again, and we'll pivot to presenting vaccination rates for the entire population within the city or county. And that is because that is what we're gonna be looking at moving forward as one of the criteria to remove these masks. This data is not inclusive of boosters, third or additional shots, and we'll be working with the data to, pre um, with the, to present that data at the next update. The city and the county, I've met and we have jointly noticed some irregularities in the county data. The county will be integrating some new data sets shortly and we hope to be able to present that new data once that has occurred, hopefully by our next update. So uh, that's where we stand and now I'm gonna pass it on to Alvin to talk about the vaccination task force. Thank you, Dolan. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor. Members of the city council, members of the public, my name is Alvin Galang, Vaccination Task Force Director. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present the latest information about the city's continued efforts in supporting the county with vaccination. As Dolan mentioned, the city of San Jose is at a, actually a 94, I just checked the numbers this morning, but 94.1% vaccination rate, first doses among 12 and over. And so the numbers continue to head in the right direction. Uh, the city vaccination rate continues to go up and the cases and deaths remain low and steady. Uh, we are continuing to have a steady number of participants at our vaccination events. Uh, for example, yesterday at the Bascom Community Center, we had a vaccination event there and we vaccinated roughly 92 uh, participants at the uh, Bascom Community Center yesterday. The county has requested support for communications and outreach uh, to youth ages five to 11. And so the city will be supporting that request, um, including outreach and communications to the youth themselves, their parents, caregivers, and of course, specifically within our most vulnerable population. And what else has changed? The expansion of approved booster vaccines. And so the Moderna vaccine and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine have been approved for booster use. What is driving the change vaccination mandates? So whether they are employer related or event establishment related, going to a Sharks game, catching Hamilton, perhaps even going to a bar or restaurant, these mandates are bringing people to our vaccination events for them to get their vaccinations. Uh, what else is driving the change? The expanded eligibility to youth five to 11. Uh, that eligibility is uh, anticipated to happen 
uh, probably around next week or at least in the coming weeks. And then the data showing the waning immunity of vaccines over time. Like many current vaccinations, a booster shot is recommended for maximum immunity, maximum protection, and so that's also bringing people to our vaccination events as well. What is new? Incorporating rental and housing assistance and resources at vaccination events. So we've been working with our housing department to whenever possible invite them to our vaccination events to offer those wraparound services or those resources for the, for the participants. We're also re-engaging with our San Jose Fire Department personnel to assist the county in having in-home vaccinations and assisting the county with that program. And so with that, I would like to pass it over back to Lee. Thank you, Alvin. And so on to good news. Um, a little over an hour ago, the Food and Drug Administration Vaccine Advisory Committee formally endorsed the Pfizer vaccination for children 5 to 11. Um, it is anticipated formal approval from the FDA. Uh, will be coming next week with full authorizing. Um, so that is great news. I'm going to cover a little bit of what we know of our pediatric vaccinations um, locally as well as boosters. And so just wanted to give context. Uh, as one of the council members asked uh, last uh, 3.1, what were we looking at? Um, and I think you'll see a much different approach from the county, um, Board of Education, hospitals, and the health and hospital system. Whereas in last January and February when they were planning for vaccinations, uh, that number was about 1.5 million people that need to be vaccinated. Whereas countywide, they're looking at a much smaller number of around 160. So we're likely to see a lot of smaller locations, um, more formal um, locations, and not the mass sites that we once saw, um, meaning that we'll have uh, an easier time with some logistics and a harder time with other logistics. One of the things that I wanted to point attention to was um, for our own county, as well as um, uh, all hospitals and providers throughout the U.S., one of the surprises um, uh, in the way of regulations from the federal government um, was the vials that the visor um, uh, vaccine is stored in. So for pediatric vaccinations, the dose, the dosage is lower. And we actually have a lot of capacity of visor vaccination in our, or vaccines within our own county. And so the thought was of a few weeks ago to go ahead and use that and train injectors to take out a smaller amount. That will not be feasible um, and federal government is now going to require separate vials that'll be color coded differently to ensure that the dosage is correct. So not like before where we saw a bit of a lag in vaccine eligibility or um, availability um, within our locality, there will be a slight lag as that distribution system gets set up by the state as the state is handling that for the federal government. Again, that is being created in parallel and mirrored off of the existing new distribution center that we saw later on in the uh, vaccine efforts. So for the first few weeks here, some of um, some efforts might be more focused by the by health um, by um, pediatricians and other community clinics versus somewhere after one or two weeks, this will really open up quite a bit more. So I wanted to make everyone aware of that. The county will be um, following President Biden's plan. Um, and ensuring that of you know most vaccinations take place in pediatric or family clinics so that parents can be with their children. But the county, after extensive work with the Office of Education and school districts and focus groups, will be offering four doors locally um, as we go into this. So um, obviously pediatricians um, and children's hospitals will be one. Pharmacies will be another one with a lot of capacity. Community-based clinics that the city can or that the county continues uh, to put on with community-based organizations with us supporting some of those with our vaccine champions, and then schools. And so there'll be four doors, um, and that is based off of research and focus group from the county where parents uh, really wanted different types of experiences. And, and I know some of us with children can understand that. As Alvin mentioned, our role um, has really been defined by the county as wanting to continue to partner on communications and outreach efforts. Um, they feel that um, the team has really hit our stride in identifying and targeting parts of the community that wouldn't have looked at this um, um, previously. Um, and our last push 
while the, the numbers um, have been small, those last few events that we've been doing to get even 20 or 30 people um, has really moved the needle. And that's been deep uh, engagement and a lot of experience with Carolina and her team on uh, influencers and a variety of things. So some of the plans around those four doors are still in development between the county and a number of partners. It's our understanding that Friday at uh, the Health and Equity Task Force, um, the 29th this Friday, uh, the county will be um, talking more about sites and which schools, but they have identified over 90 school sites for mobile vaccination events. And they're gonna continue to use all of the clinics that are in place now um, in our city to administer pediatric vaccinations. So moving on to boosters, um, el eligibility groups are now no longer limited to those who only receive the Pfizer uh, vaccination as their primary uh, vaccination. Um, individuals can now choose uh, which vaccine they would wish to receive as their booster as mixing is allowed. Um, we'll say even with the expansion um, of, um, of the booster in a lot of parts of the state or other parts of the country, there's been concern about those that still haven't see, received their primary dose. Locally, uh, luckily our county has purchased um, and been awarded a lot of Pfizer vaccination as well as uh, Moderna. So we don't have that issue, but if uh, supply becomes an issue, the county will be prioritizing those that still need a first dose um, of a vaccination. All vaccinations um, will be continued to offer at clinics, max sites, pharmacies, um, as well as different mobile clinics that we'll be doing, or that the county will be doing. So you'll be able to go onto the county's website, choose your location, choose uh, the different type of vaccine that you'd like, and it'll route you um, to one of the many facilities that is in place. County staff is currently cross-training different staff and redeploying staff from other non-critical areas for a certain period of time over the next several weeks, if not months, to maximize the amount um, of, of personnel to move people through the booster phase as well as pediatric vaccination phase. And lastly, in-home vaccinations for boosters, as Alvin uh, mentioned, they are looking at a variety of in-home solutions as they did um, for the first go around for the first and second dose um, for the boosters. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carolina to talk through some of our new um, communications outreach principles. Thank you, Lee. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, and members of the public. I am Carolina Camarena, the Director of Communications in the City Manager's Office. So what has changed? Um, we remain focused on communicating to our most vulnerable residents, even as we pivot to the five to 11 year old vaccine, vaccine eligibility. Currently, we do know that data is showing us that our Latino, Latina, Latinx youth, ages 12 to 17 year old, have the lowest vaccination rate and they are uh, an audience for us. The County of Santa Clara has requested, as you've heard, um, continued support with outreach and communications, and we are happy to support them in those efforts. So our focus will be uh, to provide critical communications to our non-English speaking and most affected zip codes, specifically prioritizing our outreach to teens and children and those who have agency over them. That means reaching parents, grandparents, and guardians. Specifically, we will need to reach those who do not have health insurance. To reach these priority audiences, we have and will continue to employ a variety of tactics, including just this week, we've mailed out a, about 151,000 postcards to residents in our most vulnerable areas. And we will produce new messages and continue with this tactic as we progress and we pivot our audience. In partnership with the San, San Jose Public Library, we will distribute about 60,000 flyers to schools in the San Jose Unified School District. Again, we will continue to deploy this communication method and we'll work with other school districts as well. During last item 3.1 update, you heard that WEA works. Our WEA text alerts have been very effective in reaching those who have no other way of receiving information on vaccination sites, and we will continue to use WEA as one of our most effective tactics. 
We will continue to do mass media to reach our non-English speaking audiences, specifically radio and Spanish radio. We continue to promote county messages and amplify vaccine clinics and recovery programs via social media. Social media influencers are going to be key for us to reach the teenagers. And lastly, it is going to be critical that we work with our trusted community leaders in our community-based clinics. With that, I will hand it over to Dolan. Thank you, Carolina. Um, moving on to the next and one of the questions we get a lot, um, when are we going to be able to not wear the mass indoors? So the county did, since our last update on September 25th, issue new guidance uh, and new criteria to lift the indoor health orders on masking. So as decisions to vaccinate and wear face covering coverings indoors have driven down the case rates to a plateau and driven down hospitalizations on October 7th, health officers for the eight Bay Area jurisdictions, including Santa Clara County, updated consistent criteria to lift the indoor health orders on masking. And what you'll see here is the criteria on the left and how the County of Santa Clara is performing on the right. So what we wanna see as we come forward to future updates is the, the X that is red moving to a check mark that is green. So the criteria, uh, there's three or four, depending on how you look at it. On the left-hand side, the transmission rate must be low and stable. And the measure is we must be in the CDC's yellow tier for three continuous weeks. Uh, the second is hospitalizations need to be low and stable, and that's low and stable in the judgment of the local health officer. Um, and then three and four, the vaccination uh, rate and the vaccinations must be robust, and that must be 80% of the total population is fully vaccinated. That's not 80% of 12 and over at least one dose. That is 80% of the total population of the county has to be fully vaccinated or eight weeks after the vaccination is authorized for kids ages five to 11. So on the right hand side, how do we stand? Uh, on transmission rate, the county is in the orange tier, so uh, we're not performing to the criteria. On hospitalizations, the hospitalizations are up slightly and the ICU bed availability is down. So in my best judgment, uh, we have not performed there as well. And then on the vaccinations, 73% of the total population of the county is fully vaccinated. So that either needs to move up to 80 or we have to have eight weeks potentially from next week. So the 1st of January would be the soonest. We would have eight weeks after the vaccination is authorized for kids ages five to 11. So um, some things to note is California's health guidance for the use of face coverings may remain in effect after these local masking mandates are lifted, meaning that people who are not fully vaccinated for COVID-19 must continue to wear masks in businesses and indoor public places until a California health order is changed. The state also requires face coverings for everyone, regardless of vaccination status, in healthcare facilities, public transit, and adult and senior facilities. California's masking guidelines in K through 12s schools would also not be affected by changes to the local health orders. Those would require changes at the state level. So that is where we stand on the masking, indoor masking. So, um, you know, we're looking at probably January before we hit any of the early criteria. Uh, now moving on to the last topic is the city response on, and deep dive on advocacy. So on this front, there haven't been too many new items. There are a few changes. Uh, you heard from Alvin, there is additional movement on the federal approval of boosters. And also we have the, um, the uh, committees recommending to the FDA to approve vaccinations for kids as early as next week. Also in early October, since our last update, Governor Newsom announced that California will mandate student vaccines for COVID-19 once they are fully approved by federal agencies. It's very unclear when this will happen in discussions with the Office of Education, County Office of Education. The expectation is this won't take effect until at least the next school year. Um, as previously reported as well, the White House published its six point plan uh, and the path out of the pandemic. One critical aspect is the pending operational 
Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, emergency temporary standard that will create vaccine and testing mandates for businesses with over 100 employees. This is the ETS, as it's called, is still not publicly available. OSHA has submitted a draft to the White House several weeks ago. We have not received any update. And it is also unclear how this may impact public entities because the language that sometimes talks about all organizations and sometimes it only talks about private sector organizations. So our IGR team will continue to watch these items closely and we'll provide any updates once they are finalized from the White House. And that concludes this back to Lee. And that actually concludes staff's presentation. We're here for any questions the council may have. Thank you. <clears throat> and since I just tweeted, I better make sure it's true. We're still number one in the country among big cities in vaccinations. If not, I got to pull that tweet back. <laughs> We'll talk I, later, not, I have not looked at the websites this weekend in <laughs> thoroughly, but based on based on the national trends, I would say we're still the most vaccinated of the, of the large city top 10 cities in the All United right. States. Well, I tweeted it has to be true then. OK, um, <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for the great presentation. More importantly, thank you for all the work, collaboration with our partners at the county and uh, many nonprofits have been working hard to protect our, our community. Uh, let's go to the public first. Blair Beekman. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. As I've been trying to speak about for the past month now, uh, I hope local Santa Clara County governments can be giving and forgiving and to be considering creative good options of community health and safety for local government staff and everyday community who may feel uncomfortable with the current vaccine mandate and vaccine passports. As it is being reported, about two to three people a day are dying from COVID-19 in Santa Clara County. That is a lot. With more clear understandings, I think people are still interested in current and possible upcoming vaccines. I hope in Santa Clara County this fall, local government and community, we can continue the efforts of education and choices and what to expect of current and upcoming COVID-19 vaccines and how to better understand the virus itself. Perhaps uh, it is to begin to learn how to better explain what can be our future health and lifestyle choices. This can include how we gather socially and our relationships with internet technology. I feel the good guidelines and open uh, public policy practices of surveillance and, te and technology and data collection can very much help frame and how we can better ask more open, honest questions about the science of COVID-19 and the current COVID-19 vaccines this fall. This can also work to help better define our local technology and data collection policies and practices as well. Community health and safety always should be an important consideration. To conclude and to note a now familiar pattern, COVID-19 cases are on the rise in both uh, UK and Russia. Open shared communication with each other like this and continued simple mask use may be able to help much with addressing and limiting the spread of COVID-19 this fall and winter, and especially at the holiday time here in the SFA area in California. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, good luck how we can better talk about this. It's important to learn to uh, describe the vaccine process better, and I hope we can all make the efforts to learn how to do that. I'm trying my darndest. I hope you guys can learn how to make it clear to the public what to expect from the vaccine process, what will be our lifestyle from the vaccine process. Thank you. Back to the mayor. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Spartan. Thank, Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. I think we'll get you a, a big phone number one. Yeah, so yeah, we should all get those. To all the mayor oh. conferences. Maybe for each presentation. That's, That's right. right. That's right. right. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, first, thank you, uh, you know, thank you for, I know how hard you're working with the county. I know how hard you're working with all the partners and, and the information that you give us to share out in the community is super helpful. And, um, I, you know, I know I've been doing it as I'm sure all of us have. Um, and I've been able to go out to a few sites. And so um, as I've gone out to some of the sites in my district, um, I wanted to ask how we can message the boosters. I've noticed a um, couple of times uh, where I've gone out or a couple of locations where I've gone out, um, folks have come in for their booster and they were um, a little bit early. In one case, he was just five days early and it has to be like to the day. <laughs> and so he didn't get a shot and he's like, well, you know, hopefully he'll stay in touch. But um, how are we messaging that? Because it is really confusing, you know, to be 
to the day. It can't be a day earlier. It has to be exactly to the day. Remember as far as I, and uh, we've been providing the same message and amplifying the message that the county has been putting out, but we can certainly revise that to make it a lot clearer and put it in lay terms um, so that it's understandable by all. Okay, thank you. I just, it's just so, this little thing that I've been noticed, and I don't know, maybe it's just an east side thing, but um, that would be really helpful. I um, just also had some feedback. Those text alerts are still incredibly effective. Um, so thank you. Keep it up. Um, in fact, the last couple of times I haven't gotten any complaints. Initially, I got like one or two each time, but um, it's just incredibly effective. They really work. Um, so uh, the last thing that I wanted to ask was, so we anticipate for, for the, the 5 to 11 in November, there's a big holiday in November, right? Families are making decisions about how to gather and what to do. Um, how, I guess, what, what do we know? How are we planning for that? Because, you know, my fear is um, people are going to gather um, and, you know, the little ones aren't gonna be vaccinated. Uh, so how, how are we planning for the holidays? or the Thanksgiving holiday specifically, because it's the more immediate. Great question. So we are actually planning a social media campaign right now, and we will be uh, posting that in, in many languages, uh, but we are specifically addressing holiday get-togethers. One of our messages for uh, the teenagers, for the parents, for the grandparents and the caregivers or guardians, is to say, uh, vaccinate yourself and protect your younger siblings, cousins, etc. Uh, so we have some messaging that we're ready to shoot out. We're definitely going to need your help. So that's fabulous. Yep. Um, and on the messaging, um, I noticed that at the, the booster sites or the vaccination sites, they did everything, vaccinations, boosters, um, is, uh, you know, are we messaging, like, bring all the kids? I mean, we're planning for that once the 5 to 11. Um, I, mean, I mean, it still leaves the littles, but we can do sort of the middles, right? Um, so are we planning, hey, bring all your siblings, because if mom has to round up the kids, take them to, to the school to get vaccinated, well, she might as well bring that teenager that's not getting vaccinated, right? Um, so is that part of that messaging campaign once the, the boosters for the, or the, once the, I'm sorry, the vaccinations for the little ones comes through? Absolutely, it's gonna be a family affair. Okay, great. Um, that's it for me, thank you. I would just say too, we sort of asked that question of the county, um, like specific to schools. So around schools, they're gonna handle it in two ways. Um, in some cases, um, kids can actually bring home a permission slip and get it signed and it'll, the vaccination will actually occur during school hours. Um, That's fabulous. As, as a, yeah, as an overprotected fa a father, I, I reacted differently. Um, but in a number of cases, they're going to have after school clinics. Whereas it, the, the child in school, if they have older brothers and sisters, or younger brothers and sisters at a different school, they can all go to that school site. So they're gonna make it as easy as possible for those situations where there's just kind of one point of entry into the system. That's great, because I think that the whole family needs to go and then that's how we'll get the, scr the scragglers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Crosco? You had a slide there that the, the hardest to reach group has been from or the lowest rates from I 12 to 17. Do, do we have any indication as to why that is? You know, we've been doing a lot of research. Uh, I've been doing what I call social, social lis listening, in particular in our East San Jose communities. And I will tell you that I, what I'm noticing, and I vetted this with our county EPIO counterparts, is that there is uh, some misperceptions out there as to what is in the vaccine and uh, folks not wanting their children to have it. So we will be addressing that uh, to make sure that our, the parents, right, folks who have agency over 12 to 17 year olds understand what is in the vaccine, but there's some misperception that it's gonna harm their children. 
so I'm anticipating if that's if that's the case, then we'll see the same thing with the two to no, the five to eleven year olds. Yep, most likely, uh, and that is something that we are wanting to get ahead of. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, and you, didn't, you didn't put up uh, the census tracts or the neighborhoods where those, those uh, vaccination rates are lower. I'm imagining that they're probably similar to what we saw with adults. And so they're gonna be in Council Member Sparza's district, they're gonna be in my district and some other areas outside of that. Um, <coughs> and, uh, so uh, I, I, I'm, I imagine that uh, the stakeholders in terms of like the Alam Rock School Superintendent, Mc, um, McKinley Superintendent, they're involved in, in, in messaging and having communication or, or weekly cafecitos, which is what's typical on the east side. Yes, and I, I believe you'll hear more about that from the county on Friday. Um, along with the Board of Education and different school districts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Friday meaning the at the the task force that we that we host. Um, and then and then lastly, the other question I have is about the booster shot. So I I'm very confused about the booster shot, uh, as as so many of my residents are as well, but. So without the booster shot, are we, the, that first and second shot is, is null and void at that point? Is, is that why the, the booster shot is, is necessary? Um, so, so good question. So I, I definitely don't want to get that, that, that perception out there. It's, it's decreasing potency, it's decreasing effectiveness, but it doesn't go to zero. So, so the, the, the time frame in question is the six to eight months, which we've been hearing for a while. Right. And so uh, the booster is being encouraged uh, by the certain segments that mm -hmm. Alvin talked about, and he can flash them up again. But it is, so you're encouraged to get the booster uh, because of the decreasing strength over mm -hmm. time. Yeah. But, but you, that is not to say that the first and second dose aren't providing, still providing protection against the virus. Uh, so so that, that leads me to my next point. I mean, if, you know, it, it, it took us, uh, I don't know how many months to try and get to these numbers. Now we're, to me, it's like we're going right back uh, to that campaign again. This time it's the booster campaign. Uh, and so what is the messaging that we're putting out there for folks uh, who, you know, what does that campaign look like? It, it, and it feels like it's just gonna be an ongoing campaign, um, but in an attempt to, to uh, clarify some of these questions and encourage folks, I'm, I, I'd like to know what, what that campaign is going to look like so that we're all on the same page. Yeah, so Council Member Carrasco, like you mentioned, we, we are kind of doing the, the same cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And so the focus uh, when the boosters came out was folks 65 and older and those that are, were immune compromised. And so again, we're going to follow that same pattern like we did back in January, February and continue to, to roll out in that same January, way. January, February. So, so, uh, so this leads me... Uh, <laughs> So yet another question, you could keep opening up, you know, it's like a Pandora's box, sorry. So, uh, you know, we were very encouraged when we saw the numbers, even though some of the areas that have been hard hit were, were very low. And I don't know if this is a question for city manager or, or, or for Lee or, or any one of you, but what, what is then our anticipated role uh, with the vaccination team, because this is just going to keep, you know, this is a never ending story, at least for now. Yeah, that's a good question. And so around for the next few weeks and probably months, the county has asked us to continue to focus our resources and attention on the campaign. So around mm -hmm. communications and outreach, because that's where our team has been effective. Um, kind of the planning site, uh, location and logistics has really been done by the county um, 
um, office, uh, County Office of Education and other parties. So we're gonna continue on our piece that we've been really effective on and, and agree with you. I do think um, this is a campaign that will last a while. And I, I do think while we have some examples of what's worked really well, Carolina and Alvin and their team have done really well, especially in some of those areas where we were concerned about, um, the numbers have uh, increased. I do think there's more confusion with the boosters and does this mean me? So that's something that we need to work through in our communications um, and make sure those people know we're talking to them, that they're eligible and, and the why, which I think is what you're getting at, the why they need a booster. So mm -hmm. it's our job to try and, and, and simplify that message and we'll work with the county to do that. Yeah. Um, again, I, it, it's confusing to me. I, I wanna make sure that I, I get that message out correctly to our folks. Uh, and, the vet, and the county has done a great job of sending those kits, those social media kits. They're great, but, um, but at some point, you know, like any campaign, uh, you know, it's either branded like Coca-Cola and you recognize it wherever you go, or it gets old and it starts to fade from our, our awareness, from our, you know, just drops off our radar. And that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, and, and lastly, my question is, I, I saw on one of your slides the, the different uh, ways that you're getting the communication out. Are council offices allowed or able to, whether it's from the budget or what have you, do those, uh, those text messages directly from our, from our office to our, our uh, residents? And not the emergency ones, but just a, a mass uh, text messaging. I've never gotten a clear answer on that, Nora. So I believe there are different services that you can look at, and I would defer to Dolan on what those are. It's my understanding we have not procured a system separate from the WIA, the emergency system, mm -hmm. to utilize. It is something that we've researched in the past around community engagement activities, like a, a variety of community engagement activities, but it's, it's nothing that we've moved forward with. So it's something we could definitely look into and in that on things like this, council offices may have an option of using um, for ci for city business type things. But yes, you're right. The, the WIA system would not be available. And, and yeah, not the WIA, but I know that because I've looked at, uh, into it as well. I just need to know whether we have a, an approval to move forward with it so that we can just direct our attention to our residents and be able to direct them to either a location site or be able to alert them uh, uh, regarding the, the, the changing landscape. Now it's gonna be five to 11 year olds, um, but, uh, but still be able to address uh, now the booster. So I, I just, I can envision a lot of different messaging coming out of my office for my residents. I just need to know whether or not that is a, an acceptable um, uh, campaign uh, type of uh, activity. So I, again, maybe I need to talk to you about that later, or city manager, to see whether or not we can do that. Yeah, yeah, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, council member, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up on what channels we have and what, what channels are, can be used and how far the reach is. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you're not talking about the WIA, but, but we, some of the other tools we have in the city also have limited reach. So I, I think we want to make sure they're effective tools. So mm -hmm. why don't we take that uh, and get back okay. uh, with a recommendation on what tools might be available and how they can be used. That, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. That's it for me. And, and I, I do want to get back to one thing. I understand the current situation with boosters is confusing. Mm -hmm. Ultimately. <laughs> I think where society will get to is in the same way there's a message about get your flu shot, we're going into the winter, there's gonna be get, get your regimen of, of flu shots which, may, which will address where we are with, with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So right now because of the, it's such a, it's a novel virus so we don't know as much about it so we've got some, some of the messaging can be confusing. I think getting back to normal is getting back to the point where your, your annual flu shot message includes the things that you need to get vaccinated for, which, may, which would be also potentially the COVID-19. Yep, yep, thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate all the, the hard work and um, much of the progress here. Um, as we think about the strategy for getting 12 to 17 year olds vaccinated, I, I can't say I know a single peer of mine 
in my age group that knows how to effectively communicate to a 12 to 17 year old in their own household, let alone in the world. Um, and, and so have, have we been working with the county maybe to have focus groups to try to understand teens or is it, do we feel that the constraint is really around the parents? Twofold, Mayor. So I do think we need to reach teenagers. So 12 to 17 year olds do have influence over their parents and their peers. So we have a meeting with our counterparts, the county EPIOs on Friday, and that is exactly the question we intend to ask. Have you done any focus groups for the teenagers? Uh, though independently, we are also going to do our own informal focus groups for 12 to 17 year olds. Right. And we um, are hoping that all of you will assist us uh, in addition to reaching out to our youth commission and asking them for their feedback as well. We've had great success with our informal focus groups. It is a cost-effective way to ensure that our messages are resonating with the intended audience. The second part of that is we must also uh, reach those who have agency over this age group. So we have got to reach the parents, the grandparents, and the guardians. And given the demographic and our focus on our hardest hit populations, we will continue to employ the tactics that have worked very, very well for us in the past year. Uh, and we'll add more as we learn. Fair enough, thank you. Um, I, you know, it's been about a century since I was 16 years old, but um, I, I do know that when I was 16, the most powerful force in the universe was FOMO, the fear of missing out. And <laughs> You know, we were pretty effective, I think, working with the county, I don't know, several months ago, I remember when there was a, um, there was a Bad Bunny concert, we used some tickets, and I was thinking, you know, hey, if we can get Doja Cat in town, you know, could we be using arena tickets? Um, are we still talking to our friends at the Sharks in the arena to see if we can use that as an inducement? Because I would imagine that would be one thing that teens would really be interested in, particularly since you have to be vaccinated to get in the door. Yes, we are, and we've actually held a majority of those dates that might appeal to our teenage population um, for that type of work. So that is definitely part of the work stream and, and trying to encourage that age group. Okay, thank you. Happy to help in any way if I can. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, not that I, you know, on speed dial with Doja Cat, but I mean <laughs> with the arena. Um, the uh, I agree that the text alerts are really effective. Um, I appreciate that remark from Councilmember Sparza because I, I get those things and as much as I'm irritated by text messages, it's really effective. Uh, one question about our website, the flash page or the first page still says slow the spread. And um, it sounds so 2020. Um, aren't we past the slow the spread days? Aren't we into sort of vaccinate and masconate or something like that? I, is there, is there something else we should be telling people? Good point. We will take a look at that, and we will make sure it's more relevant and more 2021. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm told that several colleagues are, uh, have their hands up on the remotely, so uh, Councilman Cohen? Yes, thank you. And uh, even though I guess it's been a while since you've been 16, you still you obviously know who the uh, teenagers are excited by these days, so you're keeping up in some way. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Maybe you maybe, um, can answer this and help clarify, I think, some of the confusion that we're here, that I'm hearing, and I know Council Member Carrasco was asking some questions around this. Uh, the, the definition of fully vaccinated isn't going to change. Two doses will be fully vaccinated, and the booster has nothing to do with that. Uh, is, is, that's correct, right? Yes, as, as it stands right now, Council Member Cohen, that is the, the definition. And I think as we, as so, the, we will be switching to reporting on total population, fully vaccinated, we're fully vaccinated is the regimen that's recommended for that vaccine, which may be one or maybe two. They have not updated fully vaccinated to be inclusive of, of the booster. Um, and we'll see how that evolves. Yeah, and I suppose it can evolve. I hope that won't be the case. And my opinion, my, my understanding has been that the vaccine will be at this point a voluntary thing for people who feel like they need extra protection. And the CDC is telling people what categories would benefit from extra protection. But our definition of fully vaccinated 
is two doses. And I think we have to just, I, I understand that there's confusion with this new booster that people are now wondering if they're fully vaccinated, how that'll affect the mandates, the, the things that we said about going to events. All of those things will be based on two do the one dose of J&J &J or two both doses of the others. Um, and there is no intention at this point to change that definition, although certainly it's worth encouraging people who fall into the proper categories to get boosters. That, that, that is correct. And, and to be clear, the current CDC guidance for boosters is for, don't know why I have an echo, sorry, for uh, categories. 65 and older, ages 18 plus who live in long-term care settings, ages 18 plus who have underlying medical conditions, and fourth and last, 18 plus who live or work in high-risk settings. Thank you. Anyway, I, I think I just wanted to make the point that we should be clear in this communication when we start talking about boosters that we're not we're not moving the goalposts as far as the other requirements that we've that we've put in place that. We're still, our primary focus is still on getting 100% of our residents vaccinated under what was the definition of fully vaccinated before the boosters were approved. Correct and agreed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, we'll go, we'll to, go to Council Member Arenas and then come back to Council Members here. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, First of all, I just want to start off. I always like to start off with um, gratitude. And I heard loud and clear that some of um, our previous feedback on communication strategies has been integrated. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, one of which is, um, Carolina, I think you mentioned it a couple of times, influencers and especially maybe local influencers. Can you expand on that? Can you tell me more? Uh, about who who our influencers are for um, adults and and for the youth. I would love to be able to name them all off, but I also <laughs> am not in that age group anymore. And I'm happy to provide you with the list. But we do have local social media influencers, and I'll tell you about our Zomad campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did was focused on uh, influencers that were specific to area to our area, our local area, San Jose in the Bay Area, and who had a following of 100 or more, 100,000 people or more. So uh -huh. they are micro influencers, uh, as opposed to say, uh, yeah. the Doja Cats or the Kim Kardashians, <laughs> et cetera. Um, yeah. So that proved to be a pretty successful campaign and we would like to deploy it. Uh, looking at new social media influencers to reach the 12 to 17 year old, specifically our Latina, Latino, Latinx um, youth. And so, yeah, and so you said um, the successful strategy was um, targeting influencers with 100,000 um, and above? Less than 100,000. We want to oh, do micro, uh -huh, micro oh, okay. influencers at this okay. point. Okay, got it. Um, so in... I guess I'm trying to figure out how do we know when it's successful um, with a place-based strategy. Um, we, you know, I was able to get on the county dashboard and look at the um, at the uh, wave of influence in terms of vaccinations that were um, lighting up as you, um, uh, you know, as you see, as you saw from from the center point of a vaccination site outward, you would see additional um, people getting vaccinated. And so we, we understood that vaccination, um, uh, the strategies for uh, place-based strategies for vaccinations were effective. How do we know when this is effective? How, how do we see th that breakdown in terms of, um, uh, I think council member Carrasco brought it up. We don't, we didn't see in this presentation any breakdown of our areas. And to me, that's one of the ways that we uh, can measure success. Um, how are you all measuring success? Let me address specifically our uh, micro social media and our micro influencers. So what we looked at, and I think a few of your colleagues might appreciate this, we looked at what the industry calls CTRs or click-through rates. 
So the social media influencers would post a message about having their vaccine or getting some sort of assistance. Uh, you know, here's where you can find free food. Here's where you can get some rental assistance. And if that link went directly back to our website, we can actually see an increase in web visits. Mm -hmm. um, the other uh, measure that we will look at is likes, shares, comments. Uh, and based on that data, we are able to surmise whether or not that social media influencer was successful in reaching the intended audience. And furthermore, whether it was successful in having people visit our website for more information. Got it. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Um, well, let me add to, to that to see if um, this is something that could be integrated um, as you further your strategies um, in our Latin ex Latino and Latina communities, especially those that are younger. As my son is walking in with earbuds in his <laughs> on his ears and no no recognition of his parents in the room. Um, prizes and uh, and money always speak to our youth. I mean, that's why we have uh, so many folks subscribing to be um, in, a, in somebody's channel because they're going to win a prize because, um, uh, you know, they're giving away swag um, because they have, they're giving away their merch. Um, all, all of these things are things that, that we know work with, with our young folks. Um, and dare I say with almost everyone, um, everybody loves to win. So is that something that we could integrate with, with some of those influencers? Absolutely. And I think Lee spoke to that earlier. We can definitely include some incentives as part of that social media uh, campaign with our micro influencers. And I do want to say, and I didn't mention earlier, but the other one that we have seen some success with is Spotify, uh, specifically for the younger generation. So we'll right. likely post some ads on Spotify as well. That's awesome. Um, I, uh, I, I'm really glad to see how, that you are all keeping your eye on this and, um, and, and allowing us to also uh, journey with you as you're figuring out what works best for our community. Um, it would be wonderful to see some specifics in terms of, um, I don't know what a CTR is, but if that's the connection back from a web page to a social media um, site, and uh, if that is being used as a determinant of success, that it would be wonderful to bring that back to council so we could also um, learn from what you are all doing um, as we also approach our own um, respective communities. I think that uh, whatever you learn um, is useful for us as we're always trying to push information out. And, um, and it's, it's great that we all can benefit from, from some of this learning. Um, the last thing I was going to ask about is I didn't see um, the breakdown um, in terms of uh, whatever we considered um, successful, I didn't see the breakdown in the zip codes um, like we normally have. Um, I would really like to see that once again. Um, and uh, even the, the, the graph on the total deaths of October in October, um, I think Mr. Beekman said that they averaged two to three a day I couldn't really tell what that number is on that graph. Um, yeah, so um, certainly Cal didn't reach none of those uh, reached up to fifty, but um, I, I didn't know exactly what those numbers would be. Yeah, so Council Member Arenas uh, Dolan here. Um, two, two things. One is our policy hasn't changed. So those ten census tracts that you've seen, I think ten or thirteen census tracts you've seen in previous presentations, that's still our focus. Um, some of the county data, because of the, the recognized irregularities and the new data sets they're publishing, we, we held off until we were wow. had more, some more accurate information. Uh, you know, we had the PO boxes in Alviso and a few, a few irregularities like that that we're trying to get them to fix their data and, and integrate new data sets. Um, and then, yeah, on the um, point, point taken, the, the, the graph showed 
total numbers of deaths decreasing, but it doesn't kind of show the death rate. So we can include that data in our next update. Thank you. And I did hear um, you say that earlier, Dylan, uh, in terms of uh, the irregularities of data from the county, I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. Um, uh, but thank you for, for clarifying this. Um, I, I know I said that was the last thing, but I am, as usual, it is not. I have one additional thing. Um, one of the things that you uh, mentioned in terms of the deeper dive that you were all doing in, on the task force is incorporating some of the assistance and resources at vaccination events and sites. Um, and um, I love that, that you're taking advantage of some of our uh, local influencers. I also believe that um, at, at a very uh, grassroots level, our influencers are those who are active in our communities um, and that people trust. Um, and so, you know, I've spoken about in the past about our hardest to reach communities. And um, this is not only just about vaccinations and it's not about testing and it's not a, only about boosters, but this expands beyond that to make sure that everybody um, who, especially in our, in our community, who is hard to uh, connect with, also receive information about rental and housing assistance so that they can also recover um, with the rest of the community. What are your plans um, in order to incorporate some of these uh, local uh, in-person influencers? Council member, can you please repeat that question you broke up? Oh, sorry, I, that's was weird that it was a, um, a little quiet. So um, what I'm wondering about is how are we uh, continuing to use our local influencers, like our um, active community members that have um, built relationships within our own communities and that people trust and, and you know, they're the go-to people. Um, because one of the things that I've made a point in, in um, in many of these uh, different services that we are rendering to our folks, whether it's vaccinations or testing when we first started all of this or uh, information, um, information is going to be key in, in making sure that some of these folks are part of the recovery phase. But if they're not receiving the information that we can't really um, say that we're doing our complete um, job and covering all of our community members. So, and so how are you um, incorporating in real life uh, local influencers that I typically don't call influencers, but I call them, you know, like the promotora model. That's an excellent question. And, and what I can tell you is that uh, we're not just using social media influencers. We're definitely using our neighborhood leaders, our, as you're calling them, grassroots influencers. And so not only are we doing that for vaccine, but what we're really talking about is um, recovery. So the promotora, promotores model is definitely something that we are looking at. Uh, I recognize that part of us reaching this very hard to reach community, typically non-English speaking community, is through people who influence them uh, on a daily basis in their neighborhood. It's when they go pick up their panel at the panaderia. It's when they go mm -hmm. visit their, uh, you know, local nurse at whatever health clinic they go. So uh, it is part of our recovery that we include the uh, grassroots influencers. Great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, because uh, as we have learned, um, there's been folks who've been left out of some of the services that we have provided online, whether it's... Um, a tutoring or a yoga session or wh whatever it is, they're missing out from some of that um, uh, uh, opportunities to restore themselves and, uh, and, and to uh, thrive and, um, and for that uh, kind of social emotional support, um, which is all important when we take a look at a person's health. Um, especially when it has to do with their livelihood and, and if they can make um, 
the rent that month. And so I'm glad that you were thinking about that and that you're um, moving towards that. Um, congratulations on this piece of it in terms of um, your communication piece. I, I love that it continues to be effective. I love those, those texts that, that continue to be sent out. I would like to just see additional information that I've um, talked about, um, but thank you everyone for the presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Council, Council Member Foley. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And I actually, I just have one question and it's regarding our schools and their distributions of the vaccine. Do we know whether they will be uh, using it as a tool to require participation in after school sports or activities that might be one way to boost the, uh, the number of vaccines in the middle school and high school population for sure. It, are, do we know what the schools are doing in that regard? So we've asked the same question and I'm hoping to get more information on that in the coming weeks. I know some school districts are very, um, thinking about it very aggressively, that that would be a great strategy. And then others are kind of going through, if this is gonna be mandatory once the non-emergency thing wears off in a few months, is this, a, is this something we wanna tackle right now? And should we just be more focused on the logistics and distribution of the vaccine at our site? So it, unfortunately, it looks like it could be handled district by district, but we're hoping to have more information on that in the coming weeks. Okay, thank you. Uh I would think that would be helpful to some of the schools, uh, school districts to be able to say that. I know there are outside organizations, theater companies, et cetera, who cater to children who require the kids uh, now that they can be to be vaccinated in order to participate. So that's one, uh, one way uh, to encourage participation. So I'll follow up with some of the school districts to see what they're doing too, but thank you. Thank you, Council Member Pros. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And just wanted to tack on, obviously on this, uh, this data in regards to the, the youth, Latin, uh, Latino, uh, Latinx youth, 12 to 17 years old, just uh, continues to be alarming, I think, but looking at it anecdotally um, within my own family, it, it has me thinking of um, my nephew who was very hesitant and I would say he got most of his, his influence from his father who was very hesitant. Um, and ultimately actually his father had, had gotten COVID earlier in the year. And I think that's given a lot of people um, this, this sense of invincibility of, hey, I already have COVID, I have the natural immunities, uh, there's no need for me to get the, the vaccine. And then again, obviously the, there's influence that could be passed down to their children or youth. Ultimately what got him to do it was he wanted to play football for his junior year. And so, um, you know, he, he did it. <laughs> so there was a, a factor, right? A different factor that, that was there. But I think it just goes to show, um, you know, that, that certainly there's, there's other influences out there. I think the biggest influence, especially for um, these youth is gonna be their parents, right? Or some adult role model in their life. And, um, and that's where I think that the, the, the challenge is, is that if we still have um, many of them in need of the vaccine, then, then we not only have to focus on that 12 to 17, um, but we need to somehow get their parents in, as well. And right, so it's, it's twofold. Um, and I do think there are some, um, some methods that are very helpful. Again, I would say that the text messaging has been very effective uh, for me. I, I don't know if, you know, the, the, the postcards, I think Councilmember uh, Carrasco was saying it, that, you know, it, at one point, some of this just becomes noise, right? And, and, and you don't, you're not really paying attention to it anymore. So you need something else to, to stimulate you. And, and I do think um, it's other driving factors. Clearly what the governor has stated, that's gonna be a huge factor, but that's likely not till next school year is what we're hearing. So in the meantime, um, I do think these, right, the, the, whether it's the, the influencers, I, I think that's great, especially for this, this younger crowd, but also finding another reason why they have to get vaccinated. And um, I'll, I'll piggyback on the, what the mayor was stating, and uh, I was looking up for that Doja Cat. Turns out she's performed with a lot of people at what's called Poptopia on December 4th. Um, and I actually wouldn't put it past, um, you know, that it would be a, quite a draw if the mayor 
threw his name in the hat and said that he would go uh, in the booth with some of these youth um, uh, on that day. So I'm going to nominate and volunteer him. Uh, but I do think that that has been helpful um, and could be, right? Finding, again, finding something that is, you know, going to drive youth um, into a place where they're, they're going to just feel uh, obligated, right? or they're going to be obligated to get vaccinated. Um, I think sports, again, was a big driver. And likely, if we, we, we polled or looked at that data, there would probably be a very high number of youth that ended up getting vaccinated this, for this fall's sports. Um, and, uh, and so just, I think, targeting that messaging, using uh, creative tactics, finding ways to, to, to use that social media influencing uh, is going to be much more helpful than your traditional flyers or posters that are going out right. And, um, and I think it's, it's just something we want to continue to educate people on. Uh, but I think as we get lower and lower in regards to the number of unvaccinated people, which as the mayor was right, is, is very proud of, and I think we all are on our high vaccination numbers, we start getting to groups of individuals that I don't think education is going to make a difference anymore, right? They're going to have heard it, their friends, somebody, their family, the, you know, it's, it's no longer a secret, right? And they're going to run into more people. They're going to know more people themselves that are vaccinated. And so at that point, I think it has to be something else, right? It's no longer the education. It has to be something else that is now kind of compelling them to really understand and, and to make that decision. We saw it happening, um, you know, in professional sports, uh, Andrew Wiggins with the, the, the Warriors, right? And his statement was, I, I didn't want to get the vaccine, but I didn't want to miss out on playing basketball more. <laughs> right? So he just sort of made a decision on, on one or the other. And again, that kind of influence, um, I think, is, it can be impactful. And really, some of those decisions just need to be put in front of people that, that, that helps them make the, their decision. So uh, thank you for the update, though, uh, and for the work. And uh, certainly does feel like we're starting back again as we're getting to these, these boosters now and, and, and as we are. Um, and I think, you know, uh, we all sort of expected that. It's just a, a bit of reluctance in, in wanting to be done with this, uh, but yet knowing that's just not the reality. So, but thanks again. Thanks, Council Member. There's, we've had a lot of great feedback and discussions. One thing I kind of want to frame this is um, in discussions with the County of Office of Education, Dr. Dewan, who is partnered at the HIP with Dr. Fencer Scheib, in the communications, one of the things from the focus groups was inconsistent messaging was as much of a deterrent as anything. So you're, you're going to see the county being much more targeted in its messaging. So as we work with them, we're going to be balancing those things out to make sure that, that all these great ideas and all this messaging isn't actually conflicting or confusing people or, or making things worse. And the county did ask us to, to clarify that, that, that they are going to be much more targeted. There may not be as much communication like on, on school vaccination sites because they're targeting specifically that school, not the residents around the school that might, might, might decide to come. They're really targeting the parents and, and the kids. So there's, they want to make sure that the, the, the messaging is very targeted in terms of incentives. Yeah, we'll take a lot of these ideas back and work with them on that. But we do have a single point of contact and they have a single voice. Uh, which is Dr. Dewan and Dr. Fenstershive in terms of the, the communications targeted to the, the audience, which is now the, the, the specifically the, the 5 through 11. Okay, any further questions? Whew. All right, you guys survived the, the battery of questions pretty well. Thank you very much for all that important information and for the continued work. Okay, so we're on to item 3.3, which is the Citywide Capital Improvement Program Annual Report. And Matt Kano and team are here. Welcome. Thank you, Matt Kano, Director of Public Works, with me today I'm presenting the presentation, David French, Division Manager in Public Works, and also present with me at the table to answer the hard questions, uh, Deputy Director Catherine Brown and Deputy Director Matthew Nguyen. Um, I'd be remiss to not say that, to, uh, I'd be remiss to not say that um, the capital program is delivered by many 
at pretty much every department in the city and certain departments, including public works, take extreme leadership roles in managing and delivering projects, including airport, transportation department, PRNS, and ESD. Um, just because there's not that many seats at this table, um, Public Works traditionally takes the role of presenting the comprehensive report to the mayor and city council, and our partners and some of our partners are in the audience and on Zoom to help answer any questions that may come up. And um, there are several other reports or a handful of other reports that go to various committees throughout the year that provide a lot more detail, such as the regional wastewater facility, biannual report, the infrastructure backlog, et cetera. Um, and on the next slide, this next uh, table is, or there's two charts on this page. The top chart shows the broken down by city service area, the dollar value of the projects in the capital program. Um, and the bottom chart by city service area shows the number of projects in the capital program. Um, one interesting note on this slide is that even though environmental utility services is the highest dollar amount and the highest project total, um, the reason that it's the highest dollar amount is we have the um, massive projects at the regional wastewater facility. Um, the reason that it's the highest project total on the bottom pie chart is we have the quantity wise, the majority of our projects are in the sanitary and storm sewer program. With that, I'll turn it over to Dave French for the rest of the presentation. All right, thanks, Matt. Council members, Mayor Licardo, I'm David French, Division Manager, Public Works. Um, so what this slide is showing you here is all the completed projects for last fiscal year. Uh, we, we represent it by a city service area. Um, we had 64 total completed projects with a value of about $195 million. Uh, of the 64, these are both major and minor construction contracts. Uh, just as a, a point of reference, a major construction contract is a, is a project valued at $620,000 and above. And a minor project is below the 620 threshold. Uh, the program is, uh, is projected to achieve 97% on-time percentage, which exceeds the 85% target, and is estimated at 96% on budget, which is also exceeding the 90% target. And those numbers will be finalized in the fiscal, 20, fiscal year 22-23 budget. Next slide, please, Matt. Oh, I'm sorry. Looking at our awarded contracts for the fiscal year, uh, we awarded 71 construction contracts. 39 of those were, uh, were major projects valued at 121 million, and 32 were minor projects valued at 12 and a half million. Uh, you can see that we did have an increase in our average number of bidders, which, uh, which is actually the highest it's been in the last five years at 4.2. Uh, however, you do see a, a which is, I'm sorry, is reflected by the green line there on the, on the chart. The blue line re represents our variance from our, bid, from our engineer's estimate, excuse me. With the program targets to be plus or minus 5% of our engineer estimate to the, to the lowest base bid. You can see the last two fiscal years, we had a significant decrease and it does fall below that negative 5%. Uh, this really has contributed to, to COVID uh, in fiscal year 20, 20 if fiscal year 1920, there was a significant decrease in crude oil pricing. Um, we definitely saw that reflected in the bids, especially for our street projects. Uh, though the, the crude oil price did increase this fiscal year, uh, the bidding environment was extremely competitive, as you can see, with the increase of our number of average bids. And with the uncertainty of the market, contractors really were trying to secure work for this fiscal year and therefore resulted in, in lower bids than expected. This slide represents our local and small business awards and in building our city together with our community remains one of our the most important initiatives for the department. Uh, we do track contract awards for local and small contractors for both major and minor contracts. We did just start tracking minor contracts, local and small awards just last pre, uh, previous fiscal year. So we really have two solid years of data on that. With our major projects, we've been tracking over time, which is represented by the five year chart you see uh, on, on the slide back here. Uh, we did on the left hand, on the left chart, uh, that does show year over year numbers for both major and minor contracts for the individual contracts awarded to local and small businesses. Uh, you can see that the major contracts did see a decrease year over year, and our minor contracts saw a slight increase 
year over year on the number of contracts awarded to local and remain fairly flat for, uh, for the small. The chart on the right, as I mentioned, reflects our five-year average. Uh, you can see that there is some ups and downs from year to, from year, to year. Uh, and we definitely, there's no trajectory one way or the other. other. Um, but it, like I mentioned, this is something that's extremely important to the department. And we continue to work um, to, to continue to increase this and get that into a upward trend. Uh, we did identify for this fiscal year that there were two types of projects that, under, that had low participation on local and small businesses, and that was the sewer and concrete projects. Uh, looking at those two in particular, um, staff has I identified that uh, it, it could be a result from not, uh, excuse me, a, a, um, uh, the number of uh, the contractors, small local contractors available to do that, sp that special work. Um, and so that was contributed to the decrease. We do want to highlight a few projects for you guys. And so again, we're going to do this by CSA. Uh, the Community and Economic Development CSA uh, is the Rule 20B Underground District Project, which reached beneficial use in December 2021. This had a value of 1.6 million. Uh, this project installed underground conduits, boxes, vaults, and cabinets for PG&E, AT&T, and Comcast, and removed about 1,000 linear feet of overhead wires. The Neighborhood Services, uh, Tamian Park Phase 2, reached beneficial use in May of this year. Uh, the, the main aspects of this project was installation of natural turf, soccer field, all-weather track, soccer viewing area, shade structures, and an adult fitness area. This project had a construction value of approximately $2 million. This is definitely uh, one of the larger projects for the city. Uh, this is the Cogen facility out at the regional wastewater facility. Uh, this is a, was a multi-year contract, originally design build contract for 95 million. Uh, it's a great achievement, which reached beneficial use in December of 2020. Uh, and this project uh, allows a regional wastewater facility to produce the majority of the power necessary to meet the daily average demands for the regional wastewater facility. It significantly reduces emissions and contaminants, contaminants which, which helps the city achieve its climate smart goals as well. It also increases the resiliency for the facility. The Transportation Aviation Services, uh, we highlighted the McLaughlin Avenue Safety Enhancement Project. This was a project valued at 1.7 million and reached beneficial use in November 2020. And this project installed median islands and trees along McLaughlin. In addition, it improved curb ramps, upgraded street lights, and installed two intersections uh, with really the main goal of, of, tra of calming traffic and promoting safety for pedestrians and residents in the area. For public safety, uh, we'd like to highlight the Fire Training and Emergency Operations Center. Uh, this is, had a groundbreaking this year, uh, and this is a $54 million project, uh, which uh, part of the portion of the project is funded by the Measure T program. Uh, this project is scheduled to reach beneficial use in February 20, uh, excuse me, February of 2023, and we did uh, want to highlight uh, that this project is in construction um, and moving along. And strategic support services, uh, we, is the City Hall Building HVAC Controls Upgrade Project. Uh, this is a $5 million project that replaces the HVAC controls throughout the city, uh, excuse me, City Hall building. And this uh, is reached beneficial use in 2021. Uh, there isn't a slide for it, but I, I did want to highlight some, some great projects that were completed too as well, which was the emergency interim housing projects. Uh, the Evans Lane project, Monterey Burnell project, Roof Ferrari project were all projects uh, that were in response to the COVID pandemic and, uh, and the city's shelter crisis. Uh, in addition was also the Felipe Olinder project too as well. Um, and so these are great projects and, uh, to support our unhoused community. And with that, I will pass it back over to Matt. Thank you, Dave. Um, I just wanted to indicate that we have read Vice Mayor um, Chappie Jones's uh, blue memo and staff is supportive of the recommendation of returning. Um, we have a, a community and economic development report coming up in the new year, in early 2022 on local and small businesses and we can report back on those matters in that memo. 
Thank you very much. Uh, forgive me, Matt, that, was that the conclusion? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and more importantly for <clears throat> all the work. Uh, it's an enormous amount of uh, undertaking, uh, <clears throat> particularly as we consider what's going on just alone at the wastewater treatment plant. It's an enormous amount of construction that has to be managed and it's been managed very <clears throat> excuse me, very successfully. Uh, let's go to the public for comment. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, first, a thank you to Councilperson Arenas, who I think described uh, there may be 50 plus a month who are dying of COVID in Santa Clara County at this time. And uh, that will help me with my own how to better write, how I can better report on this uh, item better in the future. Um, for this item, um, I guess the first report, um, my feelings that um, the, the, the climate smart issues for San Jose that was mentioned uh, that can be of help with the, the sewage issues and stuff, development issues. The climate smart issues, they're just one small part of a very large spectrum of uh, green sustainability ideas we need to be considering at this time. And I hope that can be acknowledged in how we can uh, address the future of the city charter process. Um, to speak to uh, Measure T issues that are on the memo, uh, what all the wonders of what Measure T is helping develop uh, at this time, um, there is real uh, talk among Measure T commissioners. They're trying to consider what can be a more um, active process, how, how there can be more better community engagement with the Measure T process, public access, you know the work I do with surveillance and technology stuff. I mean, it has a lot of uh, different parts to it. And one of its parts is how to create an accessibility and understanding of, of, of you know, uh, democratic rules and principles and practices, how we can uh, work better as, a, a, you know, and function and, and organize ourselves well. Um, and I know you've been considering Measure T as a, as a place to have some technology oversight uh, before we can hopefully develop a, a com more community-based specific technology oversight committee uh, commission. So, I mean, just to, to mention these things about what's possible for the uh, future of Measure T oversight now, it can, can be a good harbinger for our future. We can do some good practices now with surveillance and technology ordinance things and open public policy ideas. It can offer them a good direction how, to, how their committees can be Back to the mayor. Thank you. All right, let's go to the council. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, I want to highlight and, and, and thank staff, David, Sandra, Matt, Vic, and, and the whole team for the outstanding work that you've done working with my small business advisory task force to try to create programs and initiatives to really identify, bring in small businesses, minority-owned businesses, and local businesses, and give them access to contracts. So I, I want to thank you for all the hard work that we've undertaken. Uh, we knew this wasn't going to be an easy task. You know, we're dealing with a situation where we have generations of benign neglect that we're trying to address. And we're going to have to use every tool in our toolkit to turn this around and bring in, you know, more firms to bid on these contracts. And so that's why um, I introduced this uh, this memo to to relook at our discount. Oh, thank you. <laughs> like old times. To, to relook at our um, local and, and small business uh, preference. And, and the percentage, uh, we're just not getting those businesses to bid. And there's multiple barriers that are involved that we have to figure out how we can eliminate or reduce those barriers and get more of these, these small businesses to, to bid on these contracts. So I'd like to move staff's uh, um, recommendation as well as, or staff's report as well as my memo. Second. Motion and second. Um, Vice Mayor, just a quick question about the recommendation. The increase from two and a half to five percent 
Is that in our, our scoring process? I just want to make sure I understand how the credit and discounts work. Thank you. And and currently it's two and a half percent of the price. So if it's, it's price. Um, if it's a hundred thousand dollars, it's twenty five hundred dollars. So so it's two and a half percent of the of the price gets knocked off on the bid to see who the winner is. But then we end up we'll award the project at the actual price they bid at. So the if they bid a hundred thousand right. dollars and they're local and small, we evaluate their bid as a ninety five thousand dollar bid currently with five percent off. But then okay. if they're the winning bidder, we give them the project at a hundred thousand dollars. This is something we have not talked through with the attorney's office yet, but we would in prior to coming back in the new year. Okay. I am supportive of whatever is lawful. Um, <laughs> I, I just had understood in the past we had like a scoring method for a lot of bids. And I'm sorry, go ahead, Matt. Sorry, for, for consultant agreements we do. So for consultant oh. agreements, it's typically um, uh, five points out of a 100-point scale. Um, and we mimicked that um, in 2019 after the Measure S charter adjustment in 2018. Yeah. They gave us the ability to put this um, on our projects and we um, mimicked that, but we used a percentage instead. Okay. All right. Well, I understand you're going to sort it out and bring something back to us. Is that? Uh, yeah, Mayor, and also just, yeah. just to elaborate on that as well, as far as the, the legal justification, in the past, we've been able to support it because it's more expensive for a local business to do business in San Jose. So you take that into consideration in terms of when you calculate these particular discounts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Matt, Matt, did you want anything? Or No, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, I appreciate the um, suggestion here. Uh, I, I had a few questions. First, I just want to say a big thank you. Um, I think there are a lot of successes to point to um, in this year's, well, I guess this wouldn't be the formal CIP. I guess we do that in June, but anyway, in the in annual capital report, um, certainly really love seeing the success around the streetlight replacements, you know, the DOT and, and the repaving. That's wonderful to see, um, as well as, you know, I think that, I guess this wasn't formally part of the citywide, but the um, the construction of the um, <clears throat> the quick build apartments, the uh, EIHC communities, you know, being able to build those within a matter of months rather than years, and doing so at really a fraction of the per unit cost of a, of a standard apartment construction. I think that was uh, it really dramatically set a standard in a way that now we see a lot of other cities and now the county very interested in following that that model and i just really appreciate it, everybody you know matt you've been deeply engaged in those um those efforts and i appreciate your leadership on it and i know many other folks in housing and and throughout the organization i just appreciate everybody rolling up their sleeves to try to do something very different in a time of crisis which is was really critical sorry i'm going to turn this off excuse me um i would also just had a couple quick questions um, the, I guess it's, it's, you know, I guess the case whenever you give us get good news, we, we can't be satisfied with it, but I love the graph, uh, but I think that's a repeat of what we saw on page six of the report that the negative variance on major capital bidding, which is wonderful. Um, but I guess that's not the same as saying the construction costs are going down, right? That's just saying the variance. Is the, the, the negative variance has been actually increasing, which is also a good thing, but I guess it depends um, because I saw that the, the price for like constructing a fire station at $1,300 a square foot, I th I'm pretty sure that's more than they spent to build self, build the Salesforce tower uh, a couple of years ago. That's a, that's a very high construction cost. And I'm trying to understand Sort of, sort of reconcile all these, all this data. Is it is it the case that our engineers' estimate is going up? <laughs> because I I don't think the construction costs are are dropping. Or am I missing something? Thank you for the question. Uh, this is Catherine Brown, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, so, you know, most of our prior year 
engineers' estimates or our engineers' estimates are based off prior year bids. And so typically we compile that information and put it together in a spreadsheet and base our current engineers' estimates off of those numbers. So in prior years, when the bid prices are higher, um, then you would you would typically see those projected forward. And now that we are in a more competitive environment with COVID-19, um, contractors are hungrier. Mm -hmm. So they, they create a more competitive bid environment. And so our bid pricing based off of those prior years where it's a higher uh, variant has now, it's, it's just created this, this larger delta. So it's, it's really the, the bid pricing based off a of prior year and then also this environment that's now created by contractors being hungry, trying to obtain work. And so that creates that larger delta variant or delta. I would also like to add that the past, I don't, we don't know if it's a trend yet, but in the past month, we've gotten some pretty high bids on some projects um, uh -oh. and, you know, um, uh, in different sectors of the CIP. And so we're, we're worried right now that um, the, uh, the trend of lower bids might, might be ending. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised to see that we had such a negative variance before, which is great. Uh, but yeah, I, I just keep hearing, whether I'm talking to housing builders or VTA or anyone else, that construction costs are rising. And so um, I guess it's, it's hitting all of us. Um, the, I, I know, you know, Matt, I, I never let this opportunity slip without asking about uh, microgrids, particularly on emergency related projects. Um, we've got, what a $54 million construction project underway now with the fire training and EOC center both underway. What do our options look like, whether it's there or at maybe some of the fire stations of getting um, reliable energy storage in place so that we're ready for the next disaster? Sure, and um, thank you for the question, Mayor. So back when we awarded the fire, tr first with the fire training center, so with the fire training center EOC project, um, when we looked at the bids um, earlier, or, yeah, it seemed like two years, earlier this year when we looked at the bids, the ad alternate for the battery came, was, was really high. Um, and um, we, so we decided to keep the money in the budget but not award it right now. Um, and, but we did award the, um, the more the more integrated par portion of the microgrid, the the panel and the wiring and everything, so that is ha was awarded and will be implemented as part of the construction. But in order to make it full, you know, fully functional um, for as a mic as a partial microgrid to keep it on the grid for a certain period of time, if there's a power outage, um, we need to buy that battery. Um, so the money is still in the budget. Um, we are. I'm not sure. We haven't completely decided yet whether the best strategy for the city is to. Um, at, do a change order as part of the current project or to wait and do a separate project at a later time. Um, we're just, we're trying to balance the cost versus the possible change in technology for batteries. Um, we don't wanna wait too long, obviously, but the, the longer we wait, there may be better options out there. So we'll, we'll report back, um, um, if not before, um, as part of our regular Measure T updates, and I'll definitely keep uh, you looped in on that but the money is still in the budget. Um, I talked to the project manager last week about this. Um, regarding microgrids overall, we, we did a study early, the first half of this year. Um, just we wanted to make sure that we were um, focusing on the right facilities and getting the best bang for the bucks um, out of um, uh, where, where we want to install microgrids. So we, we looked at 36 critical set, um, city sites, including community st centers, libraries, and fire stations. And, and um, based on feasibility of installing and, um, and other fa many other factors, um, there are certain ones that rose to the top. And so we had a consultant do some cost estimates for those, um, for those locations. And so we'll bring that, I, I'll talk, I still need, we have, we finally, we got those cost estimates in um, uh, just this month. And we do have about to eight to 900,000 left in the general fund to install microgrid. And it looks like we could do a couple projects, uh, one or two projects with that remaining money. And so we'll be uh, finding an opportunity to propose. I, I don't wanna wait till the budget cycle necessarily. Yeah, right. So we'll have to figure out a way to propose to council which projects to move forward with in the near future. 
Okay, thank you, Matt. And I appreciate that you seem to be betting on technology reducing the cost, or at least uh, making it more feasible, which makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> I know we've got companies here in San Jose that are, are you know, breaking new barriers, and we hope that the cost of storage is gonna come down quite a bit. Uh, electric vehicle industry is, is counting on that, certainly. Um, does, does a future for us possibly look like some combination where we, we ultimately can get cheaper storage and then do, for example, uh, um, sorry, I seem to have forgotten the term that's used when you don't actually buy the, the, the panels, but instead you, um, you lease them and you get the energy uh, on, a, on a lease basis. Um, power purchase agreement. Um, had we considered that, that perhaps we could reduce our upfront capital cost just by buying the storage and just getting into a power purchase agreement for the for the generation? We haven't, as part of our microgrid kind of analysis of city facilities. I don't think we looked at that specifically, but it's definitely something we can look at. Um, okay. Uh, so I'll definitely take that back to the team as we and and. Um, the community energy has been involved in the discussions with us too, and they may have some expertise. And so I'll, uh, well, I know they do. <laughs> um, and so we will definitely take that back um, and, and discuss that when we make a recommendation on how to use that um, remaining general fund dollars. Okay, great. Grades. I know you're running out of money in the, in the bond, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And then finally, uh, super excited, I guess 92% of the street lights will be converted LED by January. Uh, which is great to see. I understand what we'll have left are the 5,000 or so ornamental fixtures still to be converted. And I guess my question is, looking at John or anyone else wants to answer, uh, do we have the budget in the bond to do that or do we need to go find that money somewhere else? Um, I'm, think, I'll see if I, I'm pretty sure we have the money in the bond for the conversion of the or, ornamental lights, but I will, um, I'll triple confirm that and follow up with your office. Okay, great. Hopefully we can get there 100% because I know that'll save us money and maybe save the planet a little bit too. All right, uh, any other questions? All right, let's vote. Do we have a motion? Forgive me. Yes. We do. Yeah, I, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Moranis. Forgive yes, me. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hello? Go ahead, Go ahead Councilor, Councilor we, we can, can hear you. Okay, Wonder wonderful. Um, so thank you, uh, Vice Mayor, for um, always keeping our small business uh, in mind. And I wanted to just um, add something to the point you were making about in your in your memo and in your comments. Uh, noticing how and and the staff uh, noticing how um, there were less small businesses um, bidding for contracts. And I was in um, in this workshop. Um, that was meant for um, Latina women who entrepreneurs, and it was from the Stanford Business uh, Latino in Entrepreneurship Initiative. But they gave some really interesting statistics um, that were uh, beyond just uh, gender specific to Latinas. Um, they did say that th that Latinos or Latinx are starting businesses at a faster rate than the national average across almost all industries. And um, uh, proud to say that the Latinas were um, in the forefront of that growth. Um, and when they showed this uh, slide on the growth rate by industry, construction was at the top in terms of the increase. And it was almost at 35% increase of what it normally uh, you see folks in this uh, industry. And then followed by educational services and arts, entertainment, and recreation. Um, but the one thing that they shared that um, keeps uh, them, keeps entrepreneurs um, from really being successful, and I forget what they called it, um, but I'm going to call it the opportunity gap because there's a difference between wanting, uh, set, setting up in a, a business and then being successful in it. Um, and one of the things that they noted was that there wasn't, um, they don't have, Latinos don't receive from uh, typical institutions, banking institutions, the same um, amount of loans so that their businesses can flourish. So they really max out at a certain rate, these small businesses. And, um, and potentially this is what we're seeing here 
in terms of growth that they, you know, these, these folks um, aren't able to compete with the rest of the folks who are in that industry, or maybe they just really shut down during this time, although I hear there's a lot of construction and, um, and a lot of costs going up along with that. So all, all of this to say, how are we, um, for, and this is for staff, how are we um, lining up with what people are recognizing as an opportunity to grow businesses such as this? If we know that Latinos are leading in the state of California um, above the national average on establishing uh, businesses and, and specifically in construction, how are we fostering and how are we supporting that locally? Thank you, Thank for, you the for the question. question. Um, so our, currently our Public Works Construction Contracting Academy does have uh, educational seminars and workshops and we do a, a tremendous amount of outreach to contractors in various aspects um, through, uh, through the council offices but also through external sources too as well. Um, and, uh, and council member, I don't uh, have a, a direct contact to uh, the, the specific reference that you're referring to, but we would love to obtain that from you um, so that we can definitely reach out to, to that group too as well, because um, we are always looking to expand our, our outreach. Um, we are currently kind of, or we are in a, a pivot, if you will, on the strategy um, that we are um, trying to reach different groups of people and also to make our, uh, our educational seminars more accessible. Um, too as well, which we will be talking more about in our January community economic development presentation. Um, but we would love to, uh, we, we are open to, to more contacts so that we can reach in uh, certain groups. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll uh, send this information to you. And I just found the percentage that I was trying to recall um, on the odds of the loan approval from national banks, they're 91% lower for Latinos in California compared to white business owners when controlling for business performance. And I'm maybe, I, I think that it's safe to say that if this is the case for Latinos, that this in general is the case for people of color. And so one of the, um, uh, one of the ways that, that Latino owned uh, businesses um, that they found where it was a successful strategy was that they participated in formal business organizations. Um, they're found, they're more likely to experience funding success. And so how are we also working with our um, local uh, business organizations, especially ethnic based? Thank you, Council Member, I'll, I'll take us one. Yeah, we do. Um, We'd, in the past, we had actually grants that we had given to the, the local ethnic chambers um, and that funding, we don't, we don't have the grant funding right now, but we do, um, that, those grants typically would be used for them to hold outreach events. Um, while we don't have that grant funding, we do coordinate with them for our, um, uh, the seminars and, and, and training that David does. Um, you, you, and you bring up a great point. Um, I think one of the things that we want to look at how we can do in the future is to really enhance that and see how they can help us help bring more um, more contractors um, and people who are maybe ready to get started working with us um, to our seminars and trainings um, because in the past they have brought people to our seminars and trainings so they've been great partners um, and we have we haven't been able to yet to see a correlation a strong correlation between our seminars and trainings and new bidders so maybe there's some uh, tweak to the partnership we can do to figure out how we can find more of those people who are who are almost ready um, and we can just get them across the goal line to help become great bidders on our projects. I appreciate that. And um, I'll send this information, but this this comes these these research findings come from the um, Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll send this to you um, once the meeting ends, but but I thought it was really interesting to recognize um, what is happening in our state and, and locally and how are we directly uh, coordinating what we do here with our local businesses and small businesses um, and the people who are out there. And so we know that people are very innovative um, 
and they they are they're continuing to establish businesses so it's up to us to to figure out how we can also support them they also had in this information of course the governments at different levels are the the one of the greater uh, largest sources of contracts for for small businesses um, and so knowing that who we are for small businesses we, we need to make sure that we know who they are um, so that that was my comment i once again just want to thank um our vice mayor i know last year we we did a disparity study uh, memo together and and um I, you know i'd like to see how how we continue to really target those folks that we know have been hardest hit we know it's the people of color we know it's women and so with the, with those things in line and they're also the ones that are um, springing back into business and establishing businesses. And so knowing the information, um, we also need to pivot with, with this um, to make sure that they're as successful as they can be. And th those were my comments. Thank, thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, thank you Council, Council Member. Member. Um, um, one, one last question. I'm sorry, you guys have been uh, <laughs> doing great up to this point. I'm sorry to keep you any longer. The, um, just going back to microgrids, uh, Scott Green on my team uh, mentioned to me that uh, in the infrastructure bill, uh, we all hope it's going to pass. Um, it could be about $5 billion in a matching grant program to harden the grid. We think there could be some micro money there. I think the CPUC just authorized about a $200 million budget. I know we've got a consultant who's looking at sites right now in the city and has identified sort of priority sites. But I don't think the consultant, I think is it Evisian, that they're not actually involved in working on the funding or grants. And I'm just wondering, are we, do we have somebody's bird dog in those funding opportunities or do we need outside help for that? Um, we are looking at them, but probably not bird dogging as much as we need to. And so let me take that um, question back and think on it. and and. and uh, the Advisian agreement is actually, a, we have, a, it's a master agreement, and so we can also look at the scope of that to see if there's a uh, service order we can um, uh, get their help on. Okay, great. Grants for. Seems like this is kind of one of those unique moments where we could go find a lot of other okay. people's money to help us do these things. It'd be great to see. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I, th I think those are all the questions. Um, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Davis? Aye. Aye. That's okay. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. That's unanimous. Um, all right, thanks everybody for your work. Uh, 6.1 is a report on bids and award of construction contract for the outfall channel instrumentation improvements at the regional wastewater facility. Uh, there's no presentation. Uh, let's go to the public first for comments. I hear, see there are no members of the community like to speak. Right, there's no. Okay. Oh, uh, a hand just went up, Eileen McLaughlin. Okay, welcome Eileen. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Licardo, Licardo and members of, of the council. Um, I am uh, Eileen McLaughlin with Citizens Committee to Complete the Refuge and have been watching the outfall project since last spring, uh, jointly with the Audubon Society. Um, we have uh, been hoping that certain changes could be made uh, to this project that involved lighting. Uh, currently, the project is still re recommending that if there be 24, uh, excuse me, all, all night lighting on the bridge. This site is adjoining the Donnewis Refuge. It's in Bay Habitats. It is, uh, you know, there's some changes have been made to their original lighting plan, but it's still going to be shining light where uh, critters are needing to be protected at night. The lighting is said to be for safety of workers, but we do not think that our workers are out there every night, nor all night, and do not understand why lights need to be on when no one is out there needing light on their work. 
we'd like clarification on that. And best of all, we'd like to see that the lighting plan had changed and that there be certain things changed to uh, the color uh, temperature of the, of the lights so that it is more protective. Uh, I, that, and so I believe that some information has provided to council members of, about that. In fact, there's a letter I co-signed about that factor by uh, myself and uh, Shawnee Kleinhaus. I'm hoping that that can be considered in uh, a decision today that will make this project work. We need to have the monitoring that this project takes care of for the water quality and we need safety for the workers, but we also need to use the goal and policy in Envision 2040 uh, for Bay and Bay lands to ensure the quality of that shoreline. Thank you. Okay, I have two more hands up. Caller 5140, followed by Juliana. Yeah, I just hope you guys take wastewater treatment seriously. Don't make it a boondoggle. And if you're gonna change lights and all these things, you might wanna try also, if you're gonna do that for the birds, then uh, you might wanna help out our cats and dogs around here when, when coyotes tear them up. You know, I mean, if you're gonna manage wildlife with lights or anything else, uh, you should also think about people's pets. And people themselves with coyotes tearing everything apart here, called vector control and everything else. But I realize it's a wastewater issue. Like I said, just don't make anything wastewater a boondoggle. Because if we can't manage our wastewater, and you guys want to focus on other things like a train to nowhere, at least focus on this. Because you don't want your wastewater, you don't want a wastewater problem. Because if that's the case, the society is over with. So be careful how you manage it and the wildlife around there and everything else. And just do me a favor. Don't screw it up. Oh, by the way, let's go, Brandon. Thanks a lot, everybody. Juliana Pendleton. Hello, uh, my name is Juliana Pendleton, and I'm the Environmental Advocacy Assistant for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. Uh, I would like to support Eileen's comments on uh, the lighting at Outfall. Uh, we have been engaging with the Outfall uh, project over the past few months, most recently sending in a letter uh, for this agenda item. We would like to thank uh, District 4 and Mayor staff for talking to us on this issue um, and also thank Mariana Chavez Vasquez from Public Works for reaching out to us. Uh, we look forward to hopefully having more discussions on how we can reduce light pollution, especially in our sensitive habitats. Thank you. Back to the mayor. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, Council Member Jimenez. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just uh, the point that was brought up by one of the speakers, I was curious if there was staff here and if whether they can uh, indicate if they'd be willing to work with some of the uh, folks that have expressed concerns about the lights. Uh, I know there's, I think I got some information related to whether it, uh, they're gonna be automatic or on remote and the intensity of the light. So hoping you can touch on that. Hi, Mariana Chavez. I'm the Deputy Director for the Head Start Program from EFD. So just uh, so you know, we have been having a conversation with Audubon. I think there may have been some miscommunication just because we did that yesterday. They have been reaching out also to Council Member Cohen. So we had a discussion with Shani from the Audubon Society yesterday. We have no problem. We, we talk about that. We can work with them. We agree that we could work with them on the lighting color and also on some sort of uh, mechanical way not to have it on all the time. So that's, those are relatively minor issues. We can arrange that as part of the contract. Okay, very good. I, I think that satisfies my interest and I think the interest of many of the folks on yeah. the call. Thank you. Gracias. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for your uh, willingness to um, uh, engage in this issue flexibly. Uh, we appreciate very much the concerns raised by uh, several of the community members about the impacts of lighting on the uh, <clears throat> on the critters, as was mentioned. Um, I, I did have one quick question for you, Mariana. I'm sorry uh, before you go too far. As I recall, uh, there were lots of challenges around additional costs that we'd be bearing uh, to accommodate the, um, the project that we believe the Army Corps of Engineers would build <laughs> in phases three and four. And I'm just wondering 
as we're trying to work with them in the water district, um, is there anything about this project that would change depending on what happens with that project? No, this one is, is really just uh, focused on the current conditions. Okay. So there are already uh, some problems with the bridge, some problems with instruments and all that that we have to address regardless. So this one will be necessary anyway. Okay. There are a few elements that we consider that could be affected and we took those out of the project. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That helps. We hope there'll be a resolution of those issues soon. Okay. Uh, was there a motion, Councilman Menes? Move approval. Second. Okay. Let's vote. Um, we have Cullen's hand up. Oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilmember Cohen, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, it sounds like the motion great uh, in the motion. Something that just sort of says that we will adjust the project to include some uh, additional um, technology on the lights so that they're not on all the time, since that wasn't in the original proposal that was approved at TPAC. Um, I appreciate all the work that. Mariana and the staff have been doing since the TPAC meeting. I raised this question at TPAC, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, and asked how that was going to be handled. And they said that it would be it would be watched over time and see whether it has an impact, and then we could add the add the light switches later. But since we we know it can be done without much impact now, I would hope we could add the just put it into the motion that we would either put some kind of sensors or or switches on now so that we don't have to worry about it later. All right. All right. Thank you, Thank you, Councilman. Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jimenez, are you open to that? I, I'm open to that, but I, I don't. I, I assume some of these conversations have been had, and and, and uh, I. So I don't know what's the appropriate language to insert in the motion, but happy to. If you you've been following this issue a little closer, Councilmember Cohen. So if you have any specific language, I'd be happy to adopt whatever you suggest. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've heard from staff and some of our conversations we had before the meeting today that it wouldn't be that that much of a problem to put a, a manual switch on these lights or some equivalent solution. So maybe some language that says with the addition of a manual switch on the bridge lighting um, or equivalent or other equivalent uh, solution to make the lights not on all the time, something like that. So perhaps maybe the motion would uh, might be amended just to say modifications that will ensure uh, protection of the uh, 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 the ecosystem from uh, light exposure. That sounds fine to me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. And that's okay with the seconder. Yes. Great. Okay. Let's let's vote. Jimenez. Yes. Morales. Yes. Owen. Crosco. Aye. Davis. Yes. Esparza. Yes. Arenas. Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Our final uh, item of the day, and one I think many have been waiting for, is a SAS report on encampment management strategy and safe relocation policy. We have a presentation and uh, a big thank you to John, Andrea, Olympia, Reagan, everyone who's been working so hard on this very, very difficult challenge. Thank you, Mayor. Is this a uh, full screen or are we just doing it this way? Okay, there we go. Uh, John Cicerelli, I'm the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. With me today, Andrea Flores Shelton, Deputy Director. Uh, Olympia Williams, our Program Manager for the Beautify SJ Project, or I should say uh, program. Um, and Deputy Director Reagan Henniger from the Housing Department. We go through a brief, brief overview today. We're gonna update on the current strategy. I know we had a long conversation about things like this last week. That was very project specific to GRP. This is the whole strategy. Um, so our objective here is to let you know sort of what the challenges are in front of us, uh, what our objectives are on our work plan uh, to be able to accomplish uh, the directions from council, um, as well as resource needs, including helping inform you ahead of our discussion next Tuesday on the second about funding uh, a variety of these items. So we start with this slide. We like this image because we think it conveys um, what we are focused on. So today we're here about the encampment management strategy. That's not a strategy to produce housing for homeless folks. That's not a strategy 
um, that solves homelessness. It's a strategy that manages it in the community, trying to find some harmony and balance between those who are unhoused and living outdoors in the neighborhoods and the surrounding community. We use this image to really show you that what we're doing in encampment management is, is really truly the tip of the iceberg. And what drives homelessness are all these other things, like our housing crisis, which everybody here is very familiar with. And encampment management does not build housing. It's behavioral crises. as we see them every single day in the street, in the parks, in our community. We don't employ a health department. Uh, this community is full of violence and trauma, both in their past and in their present. Um, it is not always an easy community to work with because of that. They're not always trusting because of that. And we can't take away that trauma from them. Um, we can't take away those experiences from them. And then there's things like income equality, structural racism that have prevented many of these folks from experiencing the American dream, having any kind of generational wealth, having the opportunities that others in our community have. All of these things are out of the control of encampment management. So really we're here to try to keep the best peace between people living outside on our streets, which nobody wants to have happen, and the time and effort and money it takes to build the housing and find the solutions for them, which we all know takes a lot of time. Just a quick update. You know, there is a community plan to end homelessness for the county. Again, everybody's familiar with this um, here. We're, we are in that strategy three, and it really defines pretty well what we're trying to accomplish with this program. Improve quality of life for unsheltered individuals and create healthy neighborhoods for all. How do we integrate these two things? And that's our central challenge. Um, and moving forward, you know, I think it's important you know, when we talk about things like abatement strategies that we remember or think about or try to empathize with what it probably feels like to be abated. It's a traumatic experience. And these are people who are already suffering trauma. These are people who are already in crisis. So we don't take those decisions lightly. That's why we're trying to, to give to you an objective way of looking at these kind of situations where we can make the proper decisions because there are certainly situations where a certain encampment has gotten too dangerous, things have gotten way out of control, and it needs our intervention, and sometimes we have to disband it. Um, and we accept that that's part of the process, but I just want to assure the listeners and the council that those are very serious conversations that we have before deciding to do those things because we know two things are going to happen. Not only do we re-traumatize the people who are living there, um, but we're also dispersing them, which makes it harder for us to serve them with all these services that we're talking about, um, and often move the problem around. We're not solving it. Um, I would also ask that you think about the staff and the contractors and our partners and our advocates who work day in and day out with this directly. They witness it up close and personal, the, the trauma and the human need that is out there, and it's difficult for them. And so another one of our objectives is to be very clear, you know, have clear goals for our staff so that they don't feel like we're being wishy-washy and moving back and forth. We want them to be, feel good about the work we're doing. We hate it when we go in and we say we're gonna solve this problem and we do something or we bait it or we don't abate it and then we come back and we have to change that decision and they go, well, why did we do all that in the first place? You know, They've worked all this time to develop these relationships with folks out there and then that trust evaporates. Um, and so, uh, I just ask that you keep all of those, all of the folks involved um, in mind because it's traumatic all around. These people take that home too. You know, trauma isn't just about experience it physically yourself. It's, you can witness trauma and be traumatized, right? It doesn't have to happen to you. But certainly if you feel like you're an agent of creating that trauma to somebody else, that's pretty powerful as well. And you have to take that home with you. Um, so bottom line is learning to manage and live with this, right? Um, how do we figure this out? Um, some of you, most of you know probably how we got here. Um, you know, prior to COVID, encampment abatements rested in the housing department. Some of you may not know that in, in 
during 2019, ahead of the pandemic, we'd been having very serious ongoing conversations. We're actually closing in on some solutions uh, to propose to the council around what encampment abatement should be, when it should be done, and what department it should live in. Uh, because it was felt that housing and their mission wasn't well supported by also doing abatements, again, back to the trust issue, uh, which is really important for the housing department to be able to establish. Um, of course, the pandemic happened. We sort of stopped everything. We even, you know, we followed the CDC guidelines, as all of you know. Um, we stopped abating for the most part, except in super extreme situations. But of course, things got bad. Um, and so we stood up a branch in the EOC by June. By October, we were trying to establish a once every two week trash service to a mapped out encampment strategy. And so this is the very early stages, but by March, we came back, we got some priority direction from you uh, around making sure we keep clear around schools and the public right of ways. We were already focused on the public right of way, which primarily means streets and sidewalks, um, but other, other types of right of ways. And then really, the birthday of the actual program was with your June budget. Um, and so July 1, it became an official program of the city. We moved it out of the EOC. It's within the Parks and Recs Department um, to manage, and that includes um, encampment abatement. And so the bottom line here is a big part of what we're trying to do is build a trash service for thousands of people that have no address. It's complicated. It's not simple to do. Um, and our, our goal, as many of you know or will hear, is to get to once a week like regular residents get. Um, you know, just try to hold on to your trash for a couple weeks and see what it looks like um, in your house. Uh, it, it piles up fast. Um, so I say that part only to let you know that, you know, we've, we use GIS mapping. We create all these maps so that we can serve all these sites. We have some 220 of them and growing. Um, and when we abate, we disrupt that system as well. Um, so that is part of the consideration, right? Once those people disperse, now you, you're no longer on a route. We no longer actually know where you are, but that problem's gonna pop up somewhere else. So it's not incredibly, it's not the most efficient way to go about it, but we understand there are circumstances in which an encampment can't continue to exist in a certain location. That's just part of the issue. Um, but back to my early point, that's why we take it so seriously, just another reason. So I'm gonna hand it over to Olympia. She's gonna tell you really what we've been up to. Um, and then Andrea will, will walk through our work plan and, and let you know where we're going. Thank you. Olympia Williams, Beautify SJ Program Manager. So the Beautify SJ Program is composed of several programs that work in sync to reduce blight and beautify the city. Some of these programs are housed in PRNS within the Beautify SJ unit, and others are in partner departments that work closely with BSJ to achieve goals. The core services in Beautify SJ include legacy programs such as the Anti-Graffiti Program, the Anti-Litter Program, and the Neighborhood Dumpster Day Program. Programs that transitioned to Beautify SJ at the beginning of the fiscal year was the Illegal Dumping Program, which came to us from the Environmental Services Department, and the Encampment Abatement Program, which transitioned to us from housing. Additional programs that work to reduce blight across the city include our residential and commercial garbage services and the Free Junk Pickup Program. In addition to our many neighborhood associations and groups, we have three volunteer organizations that work closely with us in partnership to address trash in our neighborhoods as well as in our creeks. Two of our programs that address beautifying the city through a job training model include the SJ Bridge Program, which hires unhoused and formerly unhoused residents, as well as the Resiliency Corps, which is a program for youth and young adults. While there are several programs under the Beautify SJ umbrella, today's presentation will focus on the encampment management and waste services. Last fiscal year, programs continued to remove a substantial amount of trash and debris in support of the city's goal of clean public spaces. Some of the program highlights include 950,000 pounds of trash that's been collected at our neighborhood dumpster days, these events also provide an opportunity for our teams to educate our residents on how to properly dispose of unwanted items. We have found that there is a substantial um, demand for, the, for increased neighborhood dumpster days. We've collected over three million pounds of trash and debris from homeless encampments. It's important to note that the amount of trash will increase once we move to a one time per week trash pickup model. 
We have also found that the cost of dispose of this trash and the type of trash that we collected in encampment locations has changed. We are picking up more tires, metal, human waste, large appliances, and other household hazardous waste items. Since January 2021, the BSJ team has managed over 197 escalated cleanup actions, which includes abatements and other large cleanups that we conduct to right size an encampment location. Our interjurisdictional partners continue to provide to proactively work with the city to address trash, graffiti, and address encampments on their property. The interagency work is intended to leverage resources between agencies to have a greater impact. For example, let's talk about the Story Road and 101 off-ramps. Caltrans must coordinate a closure of the ramp, notify the public of lane closures, schedule the CHP, and receive approvals from the Caltrans District Office up to a month, a month in advance. The city needs to coordinate our resources to address the, to the city's jurisdiction and clean up the area overall. Caltrans has collected over 15 million pounds of debris in the city of San Jose. Recently, the state of California announced the launch of the Clean California program, which makes a $1.1 billion investment in cleaning up California. With the Clean California funding, Caltrans will be adding six additional crews contracted through local nonprofits that focus on job training to address trash, litter, and vegetation maintenance here in Santa Clara County. Caltrans is also hiring an additional 70 maintenance workers for the Southwest region and will be hosting a job fair here in the city of San Jose. The city continues to meet with Caltrans every two weeks to coordinate and prioritize areas for cleanup. Union Pacific Railroad has also proven to be a great partner. We know that our relationship did start off rocky, but it has since improved. In December 2020, we executed an MOU with Union Pacific that outlines how the railroad will, clear, will clean their property and the city will coordinate the cleanup of its adjacent property. Since 2019, Union Pacific has removed 1.6 million pounds of trash from the rail line. They continue to come to San Jose on a monthly basis and address our priority areas. The city will also continue to work in partnership with Valley Water to address trash and debris in the creeks and waterways throughout the city. Our focused efforts to understand the scale and scope of encampments helped us to craft guiding principles for our work as part of the encampment trash program. By ensuring that we target the locations where services needed most, the right locations, we will achieve an equitable outcome where services are properly aligned with needs not necessarily where complaints are most prominent or powerful. By determining the right service or level of service, we will achieve an effective outcome where conditions have improved for all San Jose residents. By determining and delivering the right frequency of service, we will maximize the efficiency of this program, which when combined, all lead to a visually clean city. This is an example of a challenging encampment site. We have many of these throughout our city. First, it is located along a sidewalk that is next to a private business property and tends to have a substantial amount of trash and debris strewn across both areas, which requires additional coordination to address. There have been fires at this encampment location. There are also complex behavior issues that we must coordinate with outreach services or mobile crisis and potentially escalate to the county to address. While the goal is to take good care of our housed and unhoused community, these types of encampments do impact the quality of life for the neighborhood. In this example is being shown, the encampment is directly across the street from a neighborhood. This particular encampment has been abated multiple times and receives regular trash service every two weeks. Here is the photo of the same area once it's been abated. We have found that areas like this tend to be re-encamped within a few days of an abatement. To address re-encampment of, of an area such as this throughout the city, we're exploring different types of deterrents can be used such as boulders. The Beautify SG teams implemented an internal performance target of 75% for on-time trash pickup services at tier three encampment sites. These are our most challenging sites to address meaning that tier three encampment sites would receive services on schedule at the right location 75% of the time. The chart illustrates the challenges that the team can have in delivering consistent services due to both internal and external factors. 
These factors can include large abatement projects, interjurisdictional cleanups, and internal staffing and equipment challenges, such as the dip that you see in June of 2021. We will continue to analyze performance data collected through the end of the calendar year to, de to develop overall program performance and outcome measures. Staff continue to refine the encampment trash pickup model and implement council direction and recommendations, including analyzing illegal dumping throughout the city to better understand its nexus with encampments. Last fiscal year, the program experienced a 37% increase in illegal dumping collected from the previous year. Since January 2021, the illegal dumping program has collected over 4 million pounds of illegally dumped items. However, there are still several items that aren't being collected since they are not reported. The, the illegal dumping that is collected by the team is mainly what is reported, mainly through the San Jose 311 app. There is a significant amount of dumping throughout the city, as I stated, that still goes unreported. To address this, the department does recommend adding an illegal dumping strike team that would proactively address trash in areas that are most impacted by illegal dumping. Now I will turn it over to our Deputy Director. Good afternoon, Andrea Flores Shelton, Deputy Director, PRNS. I'm gonna walk through um, our work plan, as John had mentioned. What you see before you are encampment management objectives. Per the city roadmap priority, we've developed four objectives, which will drive the work plan and key results. To achieve these objectives, we must continue to commit to build the infrastructure for effective and efficient service delivery. We must move forward in understanding where we will manage encampments in the short and long run and meet both the human and environmental needs in a very dynamic context of systems within systems. Olympia already touched on the recent programmatic results from the first objective, and in the coming months, as our management and analytical teams come on board, we will deliver performance metrics 2.0 that will iterate on the way we currently report. So in addition to the volume of trash collected, we'd like to include cleanliness ratings that will provide a gauge of how well we're doing visually and adopt an approach for understanding perceptions from a variety of stakeholders and residents to gauge whether we are meeting the expectations of a cleaner city. Our next objective is to create setbacks to reduce risks and ensure the safety and quality of residents that are housed and unhoused. Current resources are dedicated to abating in public right-of-ways and school buffer zones. Between now and April of 2022, a major piece of work is studying additional priority locations where encampments will not be allowed, analyzing the setback lengths and the implications for prohibiting encampments, including the resources to enforce them. Based on current resources, including all of these setbacks proposed are not enforceable. So analysis will be considered within the context of the 22-23 budget process. We are interested in hearing from you today on the setback priorities so we can begin the study and come back in April with recommendations. This objective is to identify sites where we would provide encampment trash service in both a passive and aggressive approach. It is passive because the first step is completing the previous objective to understand where the setback priority locations will be and then reveal the default locations where services would be delivered. While we do not consider these potential sites sanctioned, these possible sites would not be prioritized for abatement unless there are significant safety issues that need to be addressed. So in addition to this analytical way of backing into sites, there's a significant will to identify land and resources for safe RV locations and other partnerships willing to host tents and lived in vehicles. This aggressive approach is being led by the CMO's office and housing with the support of the mayor, council, and other stakeholders. Granted, none of this will be easy. It will take courage and the will to strike a balance that our unhoused people belong somewhere. Sorry. Where am I? Thank you. <laughs> this objective and our final objective could arguably be the most important, and it is to connect people to the services needed to survive, stabilize, and ultimately thrive. 
In the coming quarter, Housing Department will finalize the contract for SOAR services to continue providing hygiene, laundry, and housing connections at key encampment sites. Funding will expand the number of encampments with these enhancements. Housing and Beautify will use a data-driven process as well as stakeholder engagement to ensure that SOAR and bridge services are located in areas where they can be most impactful. And in addition, we're working to strengthen our partnerships within the continuum of care to develop warmer handoffs with clinicians, employment opportunities, and other safety net providers to meet basics people, basic, people's basic needs and to prevent harm and reduce premature death. So we have a lot of objectives to complete um, this year and beyond. But today, there are many doors to submitting encampment complaints and abatement requests. And honestly, Olympia Williams' inbox and cell phone can't take it anymore. <laughs> so joking aside, one of our many goals is to, is to develop a clearer, well-understood workflow and systems with our internal and external partners. This includes the how, the who, and the why of encampment management, and importantly, the final decision on whether to abate or not to abate and how that decision was arrived at based on health safety factors which could range from life endangering conditions to one's inability to comply with the good neighbor rules that are meant to maintain cleanliness standards. Also, the sheer volume of trash being collected and the sorting and disposal process can be overwhelming to our new team, seeking to meet response times and return to the field. We're working with partners at DOT and ESD to address these downstream challenges. Other systems working with its own complex issues is the behavioral health services system and the adult reentry of people moving back to society from incarceration. As Olympia discussed, uh, our tier three field teams encounter residents with complex substance abuse and mental health behaviors. We worked with them to a point to ensure clean spaces. Yet when we find someone who has a pattern of being harmful to themselves or a chronic burden to our surrounding neighborhoods, we find our options are severely limited. So we are in contact with the county to get an update on the implementation plans for Laura's Law and the Assisted Outpatient Treatment Program. We're also connecting with the county reentry program to ensure housing placements prior to release when possible. So among these systemic challenges, PRNS and housing is committed to strengthening our partnerships to build a connected, holistic system of systems. So moving on to, the, to meet our current urgencies, uh, we are here, we are really excited to tell you that we are working with OER and HR who have shifted their staffing resources to help us fill the newly approved positions. We are pleased that we have an accelerated recruiting and hiring timeline, and we're looking to fill two dozen critical field positions in Beautify, and we are on track to fill them by December. Once filled, we'll be able to train teams to increase encampment management, excuse me, encampment trash pickup to weekly, and to make more progress towards performance management activities. This chart shows the status of the budget actions and plans. You'll see that the adopted budget allocated 12.5 million to beautify operations and the PRNS consolidated model. We also submitted a request for $4.6 million that you'll consider in next week's ARP council discussion. And as uh, was mentioned, we plan to draw down 12 million of the 14 million allocated by the state to San Jose for the youth workforce development funds. These funds would be used to continue the resilience core and a focus on job training in the space of environmental stewardship, park maintenance, and trash removal in our direct discharge areas. This details our ARP requests that will be considered next Tuesday. And in particular, we're seeking funding for increasing encampment abatements with our interagency partners, which is crucial, crucial to address waterways and highways, as well as a strike team for proactive cleanup of illegal dumping. In addition, we also want to note that we are coordinating the proposal to submit to the state's California 
clean funding for strategic beautify projects, which could bring in an additional $5 million per proposal. So John and Olympia um, have talked a lot about the experience of both our unhoused and our, um, and our staff. And I just wanted to point out over the past year, we have had several of these large abatements that Beautify has focused on. And granted, they've diverted attention from regular encampment service, yet we have sought a, a we've still reached our 75% performance target. So the team is to be commended for that. But these large projects take a substantial amount of city time to coordinate, plan, ensure constant communications both inward and outward, and carry out the work. These teams have cleared the encampment at Felipe with Caltrans, also provided technical assistance at First and Component, coordinated with Valley Water at Coyote Creek and William Street area, and have worked to clear encampments in preparation for new trail projects. These are very labor intensive projects. Since I joined the team this summer, a large unanticipated abatement project of the 40 acre site at Guadalupe River Park and Garden has been planned, coordinated, and the first phase, the uh, first two phases have begun. The team has coordinated abatement and removal of approximately 1.1 million pounds of trash and 24 inoperable vehicles. I wanna call out our partners in housing and airport and our contract partners who've provided an, an enormous amount of time to meet our federal obligations. I've been incredibly moved by the dedication to the San Jose way of leading with heart, building trust and rapport with those who've been uh, let down for many years. And in the face of these extraordinary circumstances, the team has, has the heavy job of persuading and ultimately directing people to move along and leave their homes when there isn't always a housing option available. So I'd just like to call out and thank my partner Olympia, but especially Sandra, Vanessa, Paul, Irma, John, Armando, and Alex, who you see here, who are leaders in this heart work and physically demanding work, while again, picking up trash at 200 encampments across the city. So what will we be getting done in the next 90 to 120 days? We are urgently accelerating our opportunity to fill 28 vacancies to implement weekly trash pickup. And as we add people, we are outgrowing the central service yard. So we are also planning the move of the Beautify SJ team from the central service yard to Kirk Community Center, where we are also pleased that we'll be able to have a community facing building to engage with our volunteers and anti-litter um, uh, partners. We'll also be developing Performance Measure 2.0, again, moving from just outputs to ratings and perceptions, doing the geographic analysis of the proposed setback sites and services, working with our interdepartmental partners to educate our folks on abatement protocols and workflow, and again, leading the coordination of the Clean California application. So, a few communications that we'll be bringing forth to you. You will be getting a response to the Cleaner San Jose memo in the coming month. And as always, we bring the annual Beautify SJ program memo to you in February through NSE, then to council in March. And then we will be coming back to you with our recommendations for setback sites and services in April of 2022. I do wanna, uh, you know, again, emphasize the urgency to our work to achieve a cleaner San Jose and want to thank the many parts of this organization that are supporting the progress of this roadmap priority. And we are done and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Andrea. Appreciate that presentation. Um, thanks to everyone again for the great work. Uh, this is hard work and it's not easy. Uh, so thank you. Uh, let's go to the public. I currently have three hands up. The first one is Gary Cunningham, followed by Brian. Yes, I'm Gary Cunningham. Uh, I'm neighborhood commissioner for D1 and president of Strawberry Square HOA. I am not representing the neighborhood commission on this matter. I'd like to acknowledge Director Cicerelli and the staff for their efforts in dealing with this issue. The Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services Department gets tangible results as a result of their efforts. I've worked with program manager Olympia Williams in dealing with some of the homeless encampment locations and seen the results of her efforts. <clears throat> What's missing in this scenario 
is Santa Clara County, and I've expressed this at several other meetings I've attended on this matter. The county does not engage in this issue to the level that San Jose does. San Jose does most of the work in dealing with the homeless and spends millions of dollars. San Jose is the focal point in the county for dealing with homelessness. Santa Clara County and the state need to provide the resources for San Jose's program. And San Jose needs to be aggressive in obtaining county and state funding. And please, you know, don't play nice, get the resources. They are not really doing the work that San Jose is doing. And, and we, you need the resources. You're gonna to continue to the level that you are. Uh, San Jose needs the resources. Thank you. Have Brian followed by Blair. Well, I'd like to first. I, I agree with what that other gentleman said, and um, I don't have any words for people who the people who do that work are uh, blessed. And uh, this may be a little bit off task, but just for a few moments, remembering all the people who, who are unhoused over the many years that have passed, uh, often alone and afraid, and not knowing where their next meals come from. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Blair Beekman, followed by caller 6910. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I wish uh, some of our regulars were here today for this item. Robert Aguirre, perhaps Sandy Perry. Um, this is important stuff. And I, I suppose it's a bit uncomfortable with what's been going on with the housing issues for the past month. I hope uh, you know we can get into it. And I, I think something really good is is a brewing and possible uh, with with I mean we're we're doing dealing with much new subsidy funding coming in from the state and federal level. It's how do we learn how to work with that money and work with it well. You're you're considering ideas uh, of, of uh, this item and, and what I think can be the future of, of local government sponsoring of uh, encampment sites and uh, small encampment sites. Good luck in how you can work on this. This is an issue that Robert Aguirre and Sandy Perry have been working on for a number of years. Uh, the, um, the safe parking ideas have been a very interesting, good beginning example of how such a programs can work and work well. And, um, you know, I just a good luck to ourselves how we can work on this. And um, I, to have, you know, a, a healthy place to be staying with with checkups from government persons who can be of service and help uh, and, and can coordinate things well, that that can be an important feature for our future, <laughs> a feature for our future that I think we need to, uh, you know, I hope we really, uh, we want to consider that. That's how people can be healthy and stay healthy and connected. Thank you for the dumpster day things. I think that's a great way to connect all parts of the community, of a neighborhood, basically, and have great Saturday mornings where you can try to talk and learn things about each other, different groups of people in local neighborhoods. Good luck on all these efforts. Caller 6910, followed by Roland. Star six to unmute. Hi, uh, first, can you hear me? Yes. First, I'll start off by saying that I support the Cohen memo. I would just like to include uh, porta potties with that, as well as water, meaning the wash stations and drinking water. Um, particularly out at this hellhole that has been created over at Spring Street. Um, I also wanted to say that source services are completely and totally useless when they, somebody has to have complete um, and final say. SJPD is out there harassing people, vehicles are towed, tickets are given. Um, this is why we support humanitarian zones, not store sites. If there isn't one agency that has total oversight over them, then um, it doesn't make sense. Housing can say well, it's a source site and you know we're giving people more services, but if SJPD's out there writing tickets and um, the 
sorry, the ticket people go out there and give them tickets all the time, then it doesn't do any help when they're, if they're being harassed by multiple agencies. Then housing doesn't have final say. It doesn't help people. People just leave. I also wanted to make a point that unhoused people are not a monolithic group. They are not the homeless. They are homeless people. And I think people is a word that people always forget. I wanted to ask every council person for anything you're going to say today and for any proposal that you're going to push forth, how many unhoused people, currently unhoused people or very recently unhoused people were involved in your proposal? How much of their input did you ask for before you created this proposal? Because I don't think that many of you are using that. You're coming up with your bright ideas and you're not including the voices of unhoused people. Roland, followed by caller 5140. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. This is Roland. You know, I was really wondering if I was in the right meeting uh, because the title I saw here was Encampment Management Strategy and Safe Relocation Policy. And, and all I saw is basically it's you know, basically kicking people out with any kind of plan and, um, and you know, picking up trash. And I, I think where we need to go forward is, is, is to start by saying, before we start kicking people out, where are we going to put them? And, you know, if they got a trailer or whatever, maybe we can find them a space somewhere, you, you know, with, with a dumpster and, you know, bathrooms and we give them a 12 by 12 or a 20 by 20 or a 12 by 20 spot or whatever it is and tell them, you know, this is going to be, you know, your home for, you know, for, for the time being, as long as you all understand this is not going to be permanent, but we are all working together to find permanent housing for you. And this is what we need to do first. That's got to be our top priority. And then once these people relocate to, you know, whatever it is, you know, with obviously some kind of a triage because not everybody is suitable for every 20 uh, by um, uh, 20 spot. Is um, that was the train of my thoughts here. But, but anyway, we've got to focus on that first. Relocate these people in a humane fashion. And then once they move from wherever it is they left the trash behind, then we move in all the cleanup parties and everything. We start cleaning up all the trash and we are putting measures in just to make sure the trash doesn't come back. I hope that's what I said just makes sense. Thank you. Caller 5140, followed by Gail Osmer. I mean, I don't know what we're gonna do with this situation of homeless people and the parks. And, you know, I can tell you one thing, park police and San Jose PD they're usually not harassing people who don't look like they're going to pay the fine or the ticket for dog off the leash or cigarette or open container. I mean, I really see them go to work at the Rose Garden. I mean, you want to, you want to see some TJ hooker meets Reno 911, go to the Rose Garden and see what they do there. You know, you got a guy there trying to enjoy a glass of wine with his girlfriend in between the row, the rows of the roses. And, you know, here they come. Right here they come. I mean, chest puffed out, ticket book in hand, you know, waving that ticket book, pointing it right between people's eyes. I've seen it. But man, I, I've never seen it when there's a bum there sleeping, causing problems. You know how those guys are long gone. I'm not going to get near that guy. I'm not going to get near him. I'm not going to, they're not going to want to have to hand him a, the ticket book and then have to touch it and the pen and all. Nah, they're not going to. Park Police and San Jose PD focus on easy things. And really what everyone has to do is uh, make these parks better. And these people who are causing real problems, like shooting heroin, right, puking, crapping all over the place, they need to be, you know, escorted off. But you guys, there's no way San Jose PD or the Park Police, the Derek Chavon Division, I call it, are going to do anything because they don't want to have to touch those people who, I mean, I wouldn't want to do it, but, and these guys get paid so much money. I mean, they're not going to be with those. They want people who are going to fall in line. Gail Osmer. Hi, 
Hi, Hi everybody. everybody. It's, it's good, good to be, be back. back. I'm here because I want to look at all of you and look you in the eyes. Number one, beautify San Jose is the best thing that ever happened to San Jose. Thank you, Olympia. You, you and your team have shown so much respect for our unhoused community. They are the best. I'm here to talk, I'm very nervous, I don't know why, it's been a long time, about phase three at Spring and Ashbury and the, the despicable situation the unhoused are forced to live in. You all have, there's over 250 folks living there, close together, on top of each other. There's bio waste all over the place. There's trash all over the place. No one, and I mean no one, is doing anything about it. You all knew this was coming and you choose to ignore it. Let's just debate phase one and phase two with no place for phase folks to go. This is a health emergency. We have to do something, you all. You're not doing anything. Porta potties now, not next week. I know we needed to put porta potties. Why didn't housing know to do that two weeks ago? We need smaller dumpsters. We need to get them in there now. You talk about st strategy three, nobody is doing anything for their life. They're not doing anything for the quality of life. Time's always up. I would like to ask you, Mayor Licardo, if Friday you have a half an hour, ask Mackenzie to set up an appointment. I want to take you to phase three. I want you to walk with me in the dirt, in the mud, and talk to some of these people, which I did yesterday, handed out tons of warm clothing. Please, somebody, nobody is listening to the people on the ground. You have people sitting behind their desk doing nothing. You listen to what they have to say and you believe everything they say, but they're not on the ground. Please come out with me on Friday if you can. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gail. Thank you to the members of our community for speaking out. Uh, okay, we'll go back to the council now. Council Member Mahan. Thanks, Mayor and Gail. Thank you for being here as well. Appreciate your comments. Um, Thanks to staff, I know this is not a situation anyone wants to be in. And John, I really appreciated your, your opening comments. I know you all are trying to lead with a lot of compassion and trying to figure out how we better grapple with the situation in a way that's fair to everyone and, and respects the rights and needs of everybody in our community. And there's certainly no simple answers. So I, I appreciate how thoughtful you all are being about our forward strategy um, and the complexity of the situation. So thank you. And Olympia, I have to especially Thank you, we've had the pleasure of work, working together through the Neighborhood Commission, and we certainly uh, call and text more than we should, but I appreciate how responsive you've been, and look forward to the day when we're no longer texting you. So, thanks for everything. Um, I did, I wanted to um, try to outline a, a few of the points that, that were in the memo that I co-authored with the mayor and vice mayor, and just lay out some of the rationale um, for those. Um, first, though, just since it came up, I, I don't know, um, Reagan or anyone else, if there is any update on the phase three um, that Gail referred to, if there's any anything specifically on that that we might share with the public at this point. And if not, I can keep going. Um, phase three is not scheduled to take place until... Um, 2022. Um, we had planned to start phase one and phase two and to end that before the holidays, before Thanksgiving, and in anticipation of um, wet weather, which has come a little bit earlier. Um, but phase three is um, not to start until probably uh, maybe February, March. And we have discussed that we do want to do some cleanup um, around the river and the waterways. Um, to clear out some of the fire debris, um, but we will not be moving people. Okay, good to know. And, and I know we're not focused on this specific issue here, but is there any update on, on porta potties or other facilities in that area? Yeah, I can just say uh, briefly what the housing department and the the County Office of Supportive Housing is doing. We have um, 
weekly service coordination meetings of all of the service providers who work with individuals in that area as well as some folks who aren't currently working with clients there but we would like them to. Um, so Home First, our primary outreach service provider for that area is there five days a week. Valley Homeless Healthcare is there one day a week. Um, we've brought the behavioral health department at the county into the fold and they have started doing outreach um, to that area to uh, work with specific individuals that we have identified that need that behavioral health support. Um, and with regards to porta potties, we are adding porta potties. Um, it's just a little complicated uh, with our PO, but we are making changes to that. Sorry, our purchase order um, yeah. with the company that's providing the services. And it's a little bit complex because we're now involving a bio waste service provider, uh, and it means changes to that purchase order as well. Thanks. I really appreciate your efforts there on the update. So just on the broader strategy, just to go through the, the four recommendations and the, the memo that I put forward with the mayor and vice mayor, the, the um, intention of the first is I think it's excellent that we're accelerating hiring. And I know we've, we've had a lot of offline conversations about the importance of that. So the, the spirit of the first rec is really just to ensure that we have a checkpoint early next year if we think we need it. So it's not meant to create a lot of extra work, but if we feel that we are not on track to filling those roles, obviously hiring is the critical path to executing the strategy. So would love to, at your discretion, refer an update on what else we can do to escalate um, our efforts if we're not on track, whichever subcommittee or, or to the full council. And John, I don't know if you want to comment on- I, do, I can have a quick one there where we can kind of coordinate two things. We we are supposed to be back in front of you January 11th on the GRP site, but we can we can throw Perfect. that in there and just give a quick update. We got there, we didn't, you know, and then and, and take it from there. So maybe two things at once. Perfect. That that sounds great. More efficient. Awesome. And then the second rec is the, the one that personally I'm most excited about, which is the idea of uh, you know, considering adding some trainee roles that might allow us to hire people faster and specifically from programs like San Jose Bridge and the Resiliency Corps and um, give people that next rung on the ladder of their career path and maybe also enable us to fill roles faster and sort of a win-win creating continuity for some of the folks who we've recently created work opportunities for allowing them to progress in their careers and allowing us to, to fill critical roles. So understood that there could be some complexity there, but would love to um, at least have you all consider that possibility because it seems like an exciting opportunity to do good in both ways, accelerate hiring and create more opportunities for some of our more vulnerable uh, community members. And then on third, and, and in my mind at least, this was really specific to the setbacks um, that you are currently enforcing, though I know you're considering, we'll consider in the future expanding those. The current policy does not include vehicles, which initially I thought made sense. I, I wanted to share though that we've had examples of schools, a particular school in our district for students with special needs that has been significantly impacted by vehicles right in front of the school, and they are not currently included in that setback strategy. So the, the recommendation here, if it passes, is to at least consider the role of vehicles in that policy and also consider exemptions. For example, if a family with children who attend the school are there, maybe that would be an appropriate exemption. But I'd like us to at least, again, if it passes, consider the impact of long-term vehicles right next to schools, which to me at least are kind of the spirit, the spirit of the setback around schools was to create that right of way and protect the path to school for our kids. And I think not including vehicles may not um, have been the best decision. So I'd love to at least have that conversation if my colleagues agree. And then finally, I was also really excited to hear that you all are considering the creation of a team focused on intra-agency coordination, obviously super critical as referenced in the presentation. And just wanted to highlight, I know we've, we've explored this in the past, but if at all possible, you know, if, if those other, any of those other agencies are open to forming memorandums of understanding 
uh, memoranda of understanding uh, that might enable us to have a more coordinated and comprehensive approach where it's possible, where it's safe, where we have the, the ability to clean sites owned by other public agencies, where we can also be compensated for it, would love uh, for us to then move forward with exploring actually setting up those relationships, which I know we've explored, but your memo sparked that for us again, given that you are looking at the creation of a team on interagency coordination. So just of those um, four, and John, thanks for the comments on the first one. Just, I guess, wanted to ask you if you had concerns with any of the other three that we haven't discussed yet. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, on uh, number two, you know, establishing this pathway um, to jobs, that is also something we're very interested in um, for a variety of classifications. This is also something we were working on prior to the pandemic, but had to put it down. Um, and right now, so we're targeting Conservation Corps members and Resiliency Corps members. In fact, we have we have vacancies coming up where we're going to go and sit with them and do a workshop with them and walk them through applying for a job with the city. Um, and we're going to tell them what these jobs are about and what they can, what they can expect in these jobs, but that leads to a job, full-time job with benefits for these young folks. So uh, we're excited to sort of mine that group, um, and I don't see why we wouldn't extend that to Bridge. Bridge does have a, a, a pathway to jobs. It's probably probably not as straightforward as what I just described, um, and I don't know if Reagan might want to comment on that. Um, and then um, I think the vehicle setbacks are fine. Um, I, I, know, I know we're having RVs move outside of the 150 feet anyways. Um, generally speaking, though, if an RV is on the street and not within a setback and they're not causing problems, they're not throwing trash out, they're not being drunk and running around or breaking glass or causing right. problems, we're not moving them. Right. Um, and then number four, so we're, we're happy to, to, to look at that. I, what we are asking from you as a council, though, is your opinion um, on what we should be focusing on first in terms of a setback. We had several up there, several ideas, everything from a playground setback um, to um, the creeks and streams and some kind of setback there. Those are big pieces of work. There's smaller pieces like keeping folks out a certain distance from hospitals and things like that that we can probably absorb as the team staffs up. But those two in particular are very big projects that would require coordination, particularly along the waterways, of course, with our, our friends at Valley Water. Um, the last one is interesting. So we've actually tried this um, in the past. We've asked that question. We're happy to ask the question again. If I'm, if I'm a betting man, I'm betting we get there perhaps with Valley Water. I'm not so sure about Caltrans and, U, and U, uh, Union, or, sorry, Union Pacific Railroad. Um, they have very specific requirements about being on their property, you know, train schedules and trains running down the track. They don't, they don't want us on there at all. That's been the source of, of a lot of consternation in this city for a long time. And in fact, we, we are the first and only city in the nation to get a, a memorandum of understanding with them for 10 years to do a better job of cleaning that space. And they have been doing a better job, I, I will say. Um, the uh, Caltrans, similarly, you know, they have to close the off-ramp or close a lane of traffic or close the shoulder on the freeway and you've got cars flying by at 80 miles an hour um, and they have a relatively um, substantial bureaucratic process to get through even to approve a project. Um, we do have agreements with them to, to sort of uh, uh, do continuous work at certain places in Olympia and give you more details if you're interested in, in knowing more about that. But it's not been our experience when we've asked in the past that they're okay with just writing a check to us. Um, so we're happy to go down that path. I just don't want to have huge expectations that we're going to get all three. Yep. And those are our three major partners when it comes to this. Understood, and I'll just throw out there that our office has had a working group with a number of different stakeholders, in, including Valley Water, just focused on creek cleanups, and they've, at least our office, expressed some interest in better coordination. So we're, we're hopeful, but knock on wood, and understand that's, that's not a, a simple ask, but would, would love to continue to pursue the possibility. Yeah, and I should add, I forgot, we're, we're in the process of redoing our MOU with Valley Water. We actually have a current one but we wanted to define roles better. So the timing on that's actually pretty good. The MOU is open and we're in discussions actively. So 
Great. Uh, like I said, that might be the one. If I was betting, that's the one I'd bet on, but I'm not even betting on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll just under, see. understood. <laughs> Did you want to chime in, Mayor? I was just going to suggest, you know, with regard to, say, VTA or, or Caltrans, if we can help to elevate the conversation in the organization, yeah. happy to do so, John. I know you guys have been trying this in the past and beating your head against the wall. So we've had some success in the past working you know, with board members and so forth. So we'd be happy to do that. Just let me know. Yeah, and, and we're happy to engage you. In fact, the reason we have an MOU with UPRR is because the council engaged um, and they decided they want to do this. Like I said, we're the only city in the country that has this kind of agreement with us. But they're very adamant about the don't clean it and bill us thing. Um, and remember, they're a private company, so, so it's not yeah. quite the same as dealing with a government agency. Right, understood. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I also wanted to thank Councilmember Cohen for his blue memo, which I think came out earlier today. And um, I'll, I'll let him describe it. I, I did want to move the memo that I co-authored with the mayor and vice mayor and include at least recommend, include recommendation one from Councilmember Cohen's memo. And then on two and three, I'm certainly open to supporting them, but would love to hear from staff the feasibility of those recommendations. I um, want to make sure we don't tie our hands too much in being able to implement the strategy. So um, I'll just move our memo and, and then rec one from Councilmember Cohen. Okay, motion second. I assume you want to hear from staff now so you could- Yeah, and let's maybe, maybe we could have Councilmember Cohen outline. Yeah, okay, first. perhaps- uh, Thanks. Uh, Councilmember Cohen, do you, do you want to weigh in now since this is sort of on the table? Since it came up, I guess I'll weigh in now. I mean, I guess yeah. we'll let-, we'll let uh, just like he's done for for the recommendations on Councilmember Mahan's memo, I'll let John or whoever is um, best suited to weigh in on on the items on on my memo from this morning and see what their thoughts are. I just want to start by by saying, you know, we all have we 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 all have these you know hear about these spots in our district that we really want to get taken care of or we want to have people moved from. My concern, and I think I said this even. I don't know if it was last week, the week before, when we were dealing with the um, the fence issue, is that we we seem to often, you know, rush into doing more planning for how to clean something up without having a, a disposition plan, and 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 so on. My memo is just to make sure we have some thought into where where people are going to go um, as we as we abate um, as we clean sites, um, and so. It's important to you know for me not not to not to uh, add to our list of places that that we think need to be cleaned before we have enough uh, ways of 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 ensuring that that's not just moving the problem around, causing us to have to go back to the same site multiple times. I think it's important for us to have that sort of comprehensive strategy, and the comprehensive strategy includes making sure that we've coordinated shelter and housing and parking for people, especially if we're going to add uh, safe, you know, moving, moving vehicles as part of the same strategy as was in the memo that the, the first memo, um, you know, moving vehicles and having them drive and park in front of a, a home or an, or another park or another location uh, because we don't want them in, because there's a, a, a policy about certain locations isn't, um, isn't, uh, you know, necessarily going to solve our problem. It's just going to move the problem around. So I just want to make sure that we have that comprehensive strategy in mind. And that comprehensive strategy also includes, you know, working with the county, making sure that people have continuity of service if they're receiving service. So I guess I'll ask about that. I also just want to point out, and, I, and this isn't necessarily in, in saying that, that, um, that, we shouldn't have setbacks in certain locations, but I think back in the spring when we discussed this, uh, the, the memo that Councilmember Foley and I wrote was adopted at that time, saying that abatement should be the last, uh, it should be sort of the last strategy until we have a plan because it's not necessarily solving the problem. I was uncomfortable at the time with with defining certain locations for having setbacks, whereas others don't, because we it, it, everything I think has to be decided on a case by case basis. And for example. You know, we have a case on the border of our district in District 3, right by Coyote Creek, um, which has been growing into a more unsafe encampment. It wouldn't fall 
go undo, un into any of the other setback strategies. But we knew that with the incoming storms, it may become a problem for people who live there. And we know that over the weekend, um, the fire department had to respond in the middle of the night to people stuck in the creek, cling to the tree, and one person was rescued and the other person is still apparently missing or uh, was lost in the creek. And so there are places where I think we ought to be focused that may not actually fall under our setback strategy. So that's why I'm concerned about um, focusing on specific setback strategies where uh, instead of a case by case um, strategy. But anyway, I, I think I digressed from the initial question. Um, if John or you and you're somebody on your staff want to weigh in on my recommendations in my memo, I would that would be appreciated. Thank you, Council, Council Member. Member. Um, um, I'll, I'll start with the first one and then I think Reagan can talk about the next two. Um, uh, we're happy to come up with sort of a system. You know, the way I read this, you and I had had a conversation previously is, is sort of how do we get one on the list? Um, and so we're happy to come up with sort of what that criteria is. Obviously, you know, someone just pitching a tent somewhere that's not causing much of problems isn't going to probably need that kind of service. But um, certainly the example you gave in your own district, which we've also, we've also talked about, is a more complex and certainly one that needs attention. Um, there's no doubt about it. So um, we're happy to, to create a, a little bit of a process, not a difficult one, for all the council members, sort of a little checklist for you to say, if it meets these criteria, come talk to us and we'll go look at it. Um, it's not that we won't go look at anything at any time. I mean, not that we can look at everything at once, but. Um, you know, we can always put something on the list to check out um, and see if it needs help. Um, and we can also, you know, take it to our multidisciplinary team and do a, a much more in-depth assessment of what the needs are and or whether or not it's compatible with the area it's in. Uh, hand it over to Reagan. Thanks, John. Um, so for your third recommendation, Council Member Cohen, I think we would um, agree with that and tr and in our when the housing department was conducting abatements uh, we were very diligent about communicating um, upcoming abatements to make sure some of our uh, partners and stakeholders such mm -hmm. as the county and Valley Homeless Health Care were informed of upcoming abatements so that they could um, visit that location prior, but also um, connect with individuals um, after an abatement. Um, I think number two is a bit more complicated. We do have um, a goal to double our shelter bed capacity as part of our community plan. And we, it was that a goal that we uh, discussed at great length with the county um, because when you start building more crisis intervention programs such as safe parking or shelter, uh, you could potentially be diverting from more permanent housing focused programs. Uh, and so we're trying to strike a balance in our county, uh, not to mention that funding is very limited for crisis intervention programs like safe parking and shelter beds. Uh, nationally, Housing First is the prioritized best practice. Um, so we have very limited funding to increase shelter beds and other crisis intervention programs. Um, but I would say we do have that commitment to double our shelter bed capacity. We also have a commitment to increase utilization of our current shelter beds across our system. They average, I think, between 75 and 80 percent utilization. The county tracks utilization um, monthly. And so we have a commitment as a collective system to increase that utilization uh, to a higher rate and so that means lowering barriers to shelter for example making sure that people can take belongings with them that is one of the primary reasons we hear of people who don't want to take shelter is they don't want to leave belongings behind they don't want to leave a partner behind or a pet behind and so part of this 
commitment to greater increasing our shelter utilization and lowering barriers um, to make it easier for our customers to utilize. So I guess I say all that, uh, council member, by way of saying I'm, number two is just, is more complicated. Um, it is a, a factor that we definitely consider. The existing MOA with the water district outlines our procedures that have to happen prior to an abatement and it does include outreach um, before an abatement offering shelter. That, that the request isn't a simple one or a straightforward one and I know it's what we would all like to have achieved and maybe it's more of an as it's partly an aspirational um, recommendation. Um, the reason I make I, I say it though is based on experience. I mean we've had we know and I'm sure many of us have had this experience where we have a an encampment, we have a, a neighborhood or a community asking for it to be cleaned or or it fits into criteria. We put a lot of resources and effort into coming in and making sure that that area is clean. It might be along a creek, for example, and we had one a difference on a stretch of Penitentia Creek in our district where that abatement happened. And the neighborhood was happy, the, the, the water district was happy, but two months later, the encampment was back and not much different than it was before. And so I'm partly concerned about the humanitarian effect of doing this. Obviously, that's very important. The other piece, of course, is resource question. Um, if we're not going to be able to, to move people and place them, we're, not, we're, we're spinning our wheels and we're, we're duplicating efforts and spending resources unnecessarily. And so, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. We need, to have, we need to have a strategy for helping clean up large areas which are very much in the way or very unsightly. <clears throat> Some of this is about trash management and not about the management of the people living there. I understand that. Um, but of course, we're dealing with a, a major humanitarian issue at the same time. Um, and we aren't necessarily solving the problem unless we have recommendation number two on my memo as part of the calculation when making these decisions. Um, so that's why I make that recommendation. But it's not to say the staff is, I mean, I, I do believe our, our staff in, in the housing department, in the uh, PRNS, in Beautify SJ are doing a yeoman's job in terms of, you know, all the challenges that we're facing and trying to get it done. And it's not, a, and again, we don't want, um, we don't want, as we said, uh, we know the, the inboxes at Beautify SJ are, are blowing up every day and then we can't keep up with it. But that's part of my concern is that if all we're doing is trying to keep up with these requests and we're not solving the problem, we're just moving the problem around, those that we're not, we're not making progress towards our ultimate goal. Um, we're just having short-term, uh, you know, seeing some short-term effects which aren't long-term. So that's, that's why I recommended those things. Um, I guess I'd like to hear from the rest of my council, but I would like to hope that the maker of the motion would consider uh, the elements of items two and three, particularly in three as well. I mean, I know three is something that's already attempted, but I think I'd like to make sure it's it's in the list of recommendations to sort of codify the idea that the services are as important as the cleanup. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and see what other colleagues might want to say. Council Member Perales. Thank you, um, Vice Mayor. And uh, I don't know, Reagan, did you get a chance to respond to recommendation three from Council Member Cohen's memo on, on just staff feedback on it? Yeah, I think uh, the housing department feels more comfortable with number three. Um, it is something that we already do. Okay, so I, uh, it is something you already do, then it's not necessarily a, a new task that you'll have to incorporate. No, I think we have definitely have some workflow or process improvements to make now that um, 
abatements have transitioned to PRNS to make sure we're sort of in lockstep with their workflow. Um, but I think we are not, certainly not, um, don't have any concerns about recommendation number three. Okay. Is that something that the housing department is going to hand off to uh, PRNS and somebody in PRNS will be doing, or that's something still that somebody in housing will be doing? You'll just have to coordinate the, with PRNS. Yeah, the housing department would continue to do this work. And number three, we just need to coordinate with Beautify. Okay. All right. Thank you. And just while we're on the topic of Councilmember um, Cohen's um, memo here, um, and, and I appreciate his his analysis in there, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, kick the dead horse today, but I'm going to point it out. Um, I, this is why I think, uh, you know, or I don't think this is why I know um, I was alluding to the need and the situation we would be in today. I was specifically talking about um, the Guadalupe River Parkway area encampment, uh, but just in general on having a sanctioned encampment or a sanctioned location somewhere or several places throughout the city to be able to identify relocation and, and areas where we would specifically be able to say um, there is not going to be you know, abatement in these areas that we will continue to run them similar to how we're, we're running the, the source sites. We're, we're almost there as, as we know and we've increased the source sites, um, but we're, we're, we're not all the way there. And, and not only I think is it a challenge operationally, it's a challenge to explain, and I, I imagine my colleagues are in a similar situation, because we don't necessarily uh, have a response to our, our residents to say, hey, this area is, is sanctioned. Instead, we say, well, this area is not a priority for abatement, right? So it's not next to a school. It's not blocking the right of way. Um, it doesn't really quite fall into that list of a priority area. But encampment is still you know, uh, illegal, and it's something we could come out and debate. We just can't really uh, tell you when or how or where it's going to fall in that list. And, um, and then obviously what we're doing today, sort of adding some more areas, which I do appreciate things like uh, in and around schools uh, and playgrounds, uh, the mobile home fencing, residential fencing, hospitals, right, trauma, and then, and then the, the big one, the area near waterways. Um, we're not there yet, uh, but, but I think regardless, even when we get there, let's say we're at, we have as robust staffing as we, we want and we're able to address all these priority areas, it's still, is lacking clarity on the rest of the areas around um, the city where, where people are encamping and doesn't give us, I think, a, a, an ability to give a clear response to constituents uh, and to our residents. Um, and it also doesn't give those that are unhoused um, really that, that, that sense of, uh, of security in regards to where is it that I actually could lay my hat while there is not enough shelter out there in the city. Uh, it's just a, you know, I think it's a situation we're gonna continue to be in until we do have enough shelter whether it's the lowest level of shelter, which you know, in my mind uh, is not ideal, but it's, it's the easiest and, and it's what's happening now, which is in camping. Um, it's happening now whether we like it or not or whether we authorize it or not. Um, or it's tiny homes and you know, you know, going all the way up the list to permanent supportive housing. Uh, we're gonna be in this boat for, for quite some time until we get to that solution. I, um, I was um, coincidentally in, in Austin this weekend and took the time to go and tour the community first village that's there that some, some of my colleagues may have heard about because there's been some in interest from um, community members here in San Jose to try and cre recreate a village like that that has around 500 units of tiny homes, mix of uh, RV trailers. And, um, and, and I think that you know, even at that scale, which sounds great, 500 units, as we know, is, is still not solving our problem, right? 170 you know, permanent supportive housing units is still not solving our problem. Um, and so we're many, many years away in reality. And, um, and I just think that that's why we, we should have uh, gone down that path of at least looking at adding sanctioned encampments to our tool chest. Um, but like I said, it's, it's not something that I'm going to kick today, just pointing out, and maybe in the future we'll kick that again and see if, it, if it'll uh, revive. Um, in regards to the work that is, is being suggested here. I would say, and, and I appreciate the, the, the memo from my colleagues, uh, the mayor, Councilmember Mahan, and the vice mayor. Um, I think that recognition of one, that the, the, the hiring is, as we know, key. And, and you've already pointed that out in your memo in regards to the, the deficiencies that you have right now and the, the staffing up that you need to do. 
Um, so I, I support that recommendation one there. I do think that that's key because none of this that you're talking about trying to enhance is possible unless we have the staff to do it. And so that's, uh, I think that's the number one priority right now is try to get those people in, get staffed up as much as possible, and hopefully we don't have um, you know, a, a regular attrition occur occurring because this is very difficult work. And, uh, and John, I want to say thank you for the way that you framed the conversation today, just talking about the, the, the real challenge uh, and the realities of what it is that you're doing and what it is you're not doing. Um, and I think the impacts on everybody. And that's really important that it, it, we know this is extremely impactful for those uh, individuals in our community that are out there unhoused and are experiencing this trauma, but also for those that are doing this work. It's, it, this is not easy work. And um, to go out and, and be a part of this entire equation, uh, it's, it's going to take a toll. And, um, and, and we want to be able to provide as much support and resources as possible, but also, uh, I think, be able to give those individuals the resources and, and the knowledge, the information, so that way it's not just them going out and doing a simple task of, say, cleaning or abating or picking up trash, but also where they have maybe a slightly deeper understanding of, hey, there are solutions happening here. There are, there are resources, right? You're not alone uh, in, in this solution, and they are not alone. Our city staff are not alone in going out and, and doing that work. Um, and so I think it's, it's really important. I just want to say thanks for, for framing it that way. In regards to the, and I support the, the staff recommendations moving forward, uh, look forward to getting to that point where we can add these, these new priorities to the list, uh, especially around our city park playgrounds. That's something I've been hearing frequently and I would agree with our constituents. Um, and, and I think that you know, we want to be able to, to get that as a priority area to, to keep cleared. Um, in regards to the memo from the mayor, vice mayor, uh, and councilmember Mahan, it sounds like, and I was going to ask that question, it sounds like you answered in regards to the feasibility of number four. They're, they're talking about just inquiring anyways, so it looks like, you know, you gave a decent answer here. Maybe there is a little bit of wiggle room with Valley Water, um, and I understood that we did have that MOU with UPRR, which uh, when I read this at first, that's the first thing I thought of, and I just recalled how I think that took around three years to get, so <laughs> it's not easy work, right? I think it's easy to, to sort of put into a memo and say, hey, Let's, let's try to do something like this, and it sounds like it should be fairly easy enough, um, but just you know, understanding and, and, and realizing that experience that we have with UPRR, it was very challenging. Um, and so, but I am glad that we have one, and, and understandably that we have one that's pretty unique um, in the country. But I'm comfortable with, with the directions there and, and the, the uh, additional considerations. I would like to, and I don't think it was added into the, the memo, or excuse me, into the motion, was Councilmember uh, Cohen's memo, recognizing the challenges with um, recommendation number two. I think potentially what we can ask for, instead of just say simply include, similar to the other memo where we say consider including, and then that way maybe you can have a little bit more detailed conversation with us when you come back. Um, th that would be the only, based on your response that you already gave to it, Reagan. And so um, at least it would keep the conversation moving on that recommendation two from Councilmember Cohen. So I'll ask for a friendly amendment that it includes uh, Councilmember Cohen's memo with just the change there on recommendation two to put um, the wording of consider in front. Reagan, you feel comfortable with that? Yes, we're good with that. Great, okay, fine with me. Fine. All right, the motion's amended. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Sparza. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I wanted to say uh, a huge, Thank you um, for, uh, I know it took a lot of work and a lot of collaboration to put this before us today. I know how hard you all have been working on this. Um, I uh, am also very aware that it's not very black and white, that there are a lot of considerations and, um, and especially your frontline staff um, working through a pandemic uh, before we had vaccines, ex you know, uh, and it is hard. And I know uh, some of the uh, Beautify SJ staff, um, I know them, and I know that uh, some of those folks have been able to build rapport um, with encampment residents and uh, really move people to shelter and programs, and it was through their rapport that they were able to do that. So I just wanted to start off saying thank you. Um, I'm going to be quick, but I just want to go all over the place. On, on slide six, 
Um, we've talked about this in terms of blight um, and encampments. I don't know if somebody can show slide six, um, but I, I do think um, blight is, um, it, you know, there's a lot of illegal dumping that is blamed on encampments, but it's not encampments and it's just people dumping uh, things in the street because they live in an apartment or they live in a dense housing situation. They, they don't, they can't call junk pickup, right? So um, they dump it in the street. And that happens a lot in District 7. And, and I, I'm just going to make a plug for dumpster days because it's a big deal in communities like mine that have um, some of the city's most overcrowded census tracts. And so a lot of the residents in District 7 don't have alternatives. And all right, so somebody's not going to pull up slide six, but I'll, I'll just read it. Um, it shows that we've um, pulled up, picked up, 950,000 pounds of debris in neighborhood dumpster days and beautification events. District 7 alone last year picked up 750,000 pounds of trash. That's just District 7 dumpster days. That's not even what my colleagues are doing. And I know you're all out there because I see you all. <laughs> um, and, and so, but the reason I bring that up is it, it is an equity issue. It's, it's an issue for folks that don't have alternatives. And I wanted to bring that up because it's, um, and, and the, there was in the report that blight went up 37%, or I'm sorry, illegal dumping went up 37% this past year. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but um, it's not, all homelessness. It's a lot of folks that don't have alternatives. And so the fact is that we as a city need to continue to offer those services. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I also wanted to address um, data. Um, I, I um, really appreciate city staff holding the line on data because um, prior to um, last year setting up this database system and mapping system, we as a city essentially rewarded the loudest folks. We rewarded people that text the mayor on a Saturday afternoon and um, or at all hours of the day. Uh, that's what we rewarded and we really need to um, uh, look at the impacts. And so I just wanted to mention that. Um, on partners, uh, I uh, appreciate Union Pacific. Um, I know that some of the businesses in my district have frustrations when I reach out to city staff. Um, you're able to get Union Pacific to move pretty quickly and I, I see things have moved in a very positive direction. They did get a rocky start, as you mentioned, um, and it's gotten a lot better. Caltrans, I think it's frustrating for all, <laughs> um, including Caltrans, by the way, because they're getting sued for what they're doing in some cities. And so, um, so I think they're just as frustrated as everybody else. I actually wanted to um, include in that item um, of the motion, when we look at partners, that um, I wanted to ask staff to reach out to the county as well. Um, there are some encampments where there are trenches that have been dug um, next to Capitol Expressway. It's on the county side. Um, and we've been going back and forth for two years, and it potentially threatened the stability of the overpass. And this is something that we're still going back and forth with. Um, and uh, so I wanted to include that as well. Um, uh, having said that, though, the, I think the county um, are they're a tremendous partner. They are the primary. I heard some comments that the county is not doing anything. Well, the county is the primary on our homelessness system. Um, I have a lot of county facilities in my district, or they're either owned by the county or they're county contracts. Um, and so they are doing a lot. Um, however, I think that we have so much more work to do on 
um, how we work with the county on behavioral and mental health, and specifically, I mean beds, I mean placements in a program. Um, I know that the county has been expanding those services, but it's not um, along the pipeline um, or throughout the pipeline. And you know, when someone is in crisis and they need a detox bed, for example, they need it then, not a week from now. And I think that that's something we really need to figure out on the front lines. And I've brought this up privately. I've brought this up publicly. I've, um, I know I've brought this up with many of you in the county, but I think COVID presents an opportunity for us as a city if we need to pay for those beds. And I know it's not that simple because there's certifications and it's, it's health and um, all that kind of stuff. But if we need to pay for those beds, then I think we should do that. Um, because when uh, someone is by the creek or they're by the freeway and they're in crisis, which by the way, does not usually happen nine to five, right? It doesn't happen when it's convenient for the city or the county. But if they're in crisis and there's an opportunity to place them in a program, then we need to do that. And so, um, so that's something I would like to see us really uh, take a collaborative approach with the county, particularly with the precious ARP funds. Um, and um, I wanted to also say that I agree um, I think we need more clarity on cars. Um, there is a big lack of clarity on that, I think. Um, and there are some issues, some safety issues. Um, I've had accidents get caused because of that in my district. Um, and if there's a family living in a car in front of a playground, then that family should be in one of the programs and get a motel voucher that we pay for as a city, right? So, um, so I do think we need some clarity on cars. Um, and lastly, you know, I, I, know, I realize that we're balancing a lot. I appreciate how you started this off, John. Um, but it's a balancing act. I mean, I've had neighborhoods in my district that have had um, rats and cockroaches because of the, the situation in the encampments next to them. That's not true every place in my district, but it, it definitely happened, and the city had to go in there. My residents, again, overcrowded living conditions, a number of families living in each residence, um, and so it is a balancing act, but this is about health and safety, um, and I think that's why we need to make the priorities that we need to and some tough decisions. So with that said, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I wanna um, commend Olympia. And I have to say, Olympia, you're amazing. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. How many jobs do you have? Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> Too many. Like, like five jobs, 10 jobs. You know, it's incredible. Um, but, but John, I have high expectations in terms of uh, interagency cooperation. Uh, when our residents come to us, if the encampment or the debris is on Valley Water property or county property or Caltrans property, and they're coming to us, and we give them the explanation of you have to go and file this report with this agency or another report with another agency, that's not going over very well. That's not what they want to hear. Also, we're actually the experts at this thing. And if we can create economies of scale and a process where we can be the single point of contact, go in and, and take care of the situation, I think that would optimize all the resources. I understand, you know, you're saying our expectations and how difficult it is, but I think it's something that we should continue to push and, and try to try to get something done because somebody's out there. When when Caltrans eventually cleans up a site, somebody's out there. 
on the side of the freeway doing that activity. So the same issues, concerns, and challenges and, and, and risks and safety hazards that are, exist when a Caltrans sends a crew out would be the same ones we'd have to address. But it's doable because they're doing it. Um, I just want to um, focus in on a, one specific example in my district. I have an um, encampment that doesn't meet the criteria of, uh, criteria of um, what we would use to abate that encampment. But I'm getting numerous complaints from the residents in terms of trespassing, theft, uh, uh, you know, property, you know, adjacent to the encampment. And I know that you shouldn't just jump to the conclusion that the inhabitants, the homeless individuals of that encampment are committing those crimes. But if you can connect the crimes or, or, or issues with that encampment, is there a process to address that in the short term? Does it have to be tied to the individuals, tied to the encampment? I'm just trying to understand the process and what we can do and what we can't do. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, there is, it, within our own evaluation, there is a public safety component that we look at. It, to your point, though, connecting that to the individual is not so straightforward. Now, if we're seeing arrests and violence and things like that, and the police are saying, this is no, no bueno here, then we go, okay, um, that's part of our process. But when you look at some of the little petty crime that tends to happen, um, you know, stealing a bicycle or something that's just left unsecured out in the backyard or things like that, it's really tough to draw the line between a homeless person living in the area and that crime. Um, I don't know if maybe you want to add to that. I think the only thing I would add is that we do look at health and safety. So if something doesn't meet like the school buffer zone or it's not in a right of way and there's a safety or health issue, we do evaluate that and determine what type of escalated actions need to occur at the site. Um, all right, so um, again, if, you can't, if we can't create a nexus, if we, you know, through video or other means, you know, identify specific individuals that are coming from the encampment in you know, petty theft or harassment of, of neighbors in the community and go through the legal process, that would be the recourse that we come to you and say, hey, here are these issues. We've identified individuals specifically at that location who are committing these, these acts and therefore we could take action. Is that an accurate summary? Yeah, and I, I think this goes back to we do do look at uh, encampments on a case-by-case -case basis, but we would want to consider, again, um, working in concert with the police department on making sure that there's nexus and that there is a, a truly a significant safety risk because otherwise, again, we're just moving that safety risk to another location. Thank you. But we would also include this when we come back to you with our criteria, our checklist, there are many considerations. We say health and safety, but we have subsets of those that we would call out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Spars, I'll come back to you in a moment. I'm just gonna cover the folks. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Olympia, you are awesome, and thank you for all that you do. I can't imagine uh, the work that you're doing and so successfully as well, and uh, just being as responsive as you are to us and everyone else who calls in. I, I, I'm, I know that your phone is blowing up, and but you're still very gracious and respond very kindly and and take care of business. And I welcome you to when you move into the Kirk Community Center and uh, D9. We'll be happy to come over and bring you lunch occasionally. Um, I have what what the vice mayor mentioned uh, kind of triggered something that that goes on in all of our neighborhoods, and and that is uh, we have. Uh, encampments or, or un, unhoused who are right abutting next to 
retaining walls and on the other side of retaining walls are homes. And just recently in one of our neighborhoods, we had reports of ladders being brought in to the encampment, placed on the wall, and the residents very concerned that uh, they have children, concerned about the safety of their children and, and other, others. So does that rise to the health and safety issue with you, or how would that, how would you resolve that? How should we handle that? Because it's, as, as we've all said, this is about managing expectations with our, our community, our housed community, as well as treating the unhoused with respect and dignity. But how do we get a handle on both so that we are making the housed residents who have a ladder right above them and now are concerned about their health and safety. Yeah, we will take, uh, I would imagine that a ladder along a residential fence, um, after we looked into that, if again, there was an escalated significant safety risk related to that, we would consider abatement. We would also consider um, talking to the unhoused residents to move back to understand that they need to not be along a residential wall. We're currently experiencing some of these reports um, where folks are, also warming themselves with fires right next to res residential walls, um, fences, and that has been called for an immediate abatement because again, that is um, a safety risk, especially with the fire. So okay. ladders sound like a significant issue, but we would have to look at it. Okay, so we'll give you that information all offline, but the, thank you. Uh, the other question is, and you just raised it about fires. There's, uh, it's cold, it's wet, and, People uh, unhoused are creating fires that are causing some very serious concerns for the neighbors. Fires get out of control. So can we, do we, and I think I may have raised this and I've forgotten for the answer, I'm sorry. Can we provide them with fire extinguishers, the, the unhoused, or what's the, what's the solution to keep their environment uh, safe from fires getting out of control? Um, well, the first thing would be we are we're trying to work with them to provide them with propane tanks. That's what the fire department uh, recommends rather than open flame fire. That would be the first recommendation, and I believe we've been um, providing that to certain locations. Um, but again, uh, we would ask people to not burn fires and then also to not do that against residential walls and fences. So it's again, it's trying to work with folks to move back, to work, go to a place that... Um, is not within one of our current buffer zones or potentially proposed buffer zones. Um, and then again, keep as safe as uh, conditions as possible for themselves and for the residents. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very mindful of um, abatement and what that does uh, to the psyche of those being abated. That must be a tremendously traumatic experience, uh, particularly if it happens over and over again to be abated. And there, and that's what happens. You get they get moved from one area. The, my residents complain. They go over to D10. His residents complain, and they just keep going back and forth. And and we keep moving them around, and that's, in, that's inhumane, and it doesn't solve the problem. Really, uh, we've talked about it, more housing is the problem, uh, or building more housing, quicker housing is the, is the solution. And then finally, uh, I truly am grateful for this report and all that you're doing. I, I think it's a, truly a yeoman's effort, and we can't give you enough money to make your department uh, successful or we can't, well, we could try. It's really staffing issue and money, right? Um, and it looks like you're working on the staffing issue and I support both of the, me the memo from uh, Council Member Mahan and Vice Mayor and the Mayor as it relates to employment and making that as a priority because it truly is a priority for you to get the right staff. But can you provide us, the Council offices, with a service schedule to our areas so we have an idea of when areas trash will be picked up and so we can communicate that to the residents is that available yes we do have a public web map that illustrates kind of the routes and the locations and the days that they receive service so we'll make sure that we send that link back out to all the council offices again okay great thank you 
again, thank you very much. This is a very uh, complex situation. I'm actually hosting a town hall on Thursday on homelessness and have a panel of experts coming to talk about it, but I'm sure this will come up as well. We're not really focusing on trash, but I'm sure that will come up as, as, uh, as other things will. So thank you all. This has been really helpful, and I support all that you do and support both uh, support the memo. Thank you. Council Member Jimenez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to echo my, my thanks for all the work, I, I just have a few questions. One question is the the current public uh, or the school buffer zone of 150 feet. I know that uh, we, we did a walk along in, in, in an area in my district some time back. Uh, and and so what, what came to mind there was that there's actually a church that has a school attached to it and they do sort of activities there with the kids. I, I think it may be primarily on Sundays, for example, I think. Uh, but what I'm obviously not a traditional school, but I'm curious how this buffer would interact with something like that. That's a more pri private use, if you will, but still a, a school all the same to a certain extent. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member. You, um, in a situation like that, if, if it's in the right of way, we would move it because there's a school there. All I would ask from the council is that when you sort of run into these not tr non traditional situations, just raise it up to us and let okay. us know and we're happy to go look at it and see what we can do. Obviously, if it's, if it's on private property and around that school, it's a little bit more complex to deal with it. Right. Uh, right. But anything in the right of way, we would, we would enforce it the same way we do at any other school. Okay, all right, thank you. And I suspect that, I think that maybe either for further study, hospitals including trauma and behavioral settings, that in, on that same street we had something like that, a lock facility for youth. Uh, and part of the concern was, to Pam's point, fires for some of the folks that you know that 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 are in that area that may sort of start and create a situation in which some of the folks in the locked facility are going to have difficulty getting out assuming a fire were to start and so i appreciate you mentioning that and look forward to to the further study uh the thing that stands out to me as well on the further study is mobile home fencing i know we've had some mobile uh, home parks have some um encampments right up against there and so uh certainly that's a concern because we know that those uh mobile home communities often go up in flames very, very quickly. And so we wanna be cognizant of that, especially some of our senior parks where we know that the seniors maybe can't get out of those units as quick as other folks could. And so appreciate that being there. Um, the other question I had is related to what Councilmember Jones was talking about. And I'll just tell you that <laughs> I've gone out to many encampments and have had conversations with, I know I've talked to Gail, uh, I don't know if I've talked to her specifically about this, but talk to other advocates, and, and I think, I know it's a touchy subject, but I think we all acknowledge that within some of these encampments that there is a level of criminality there, right? Whether it be someone selling drugs, whether it be folks violating other individuals that live in the encampment. And so what I'm curious about is does, and I can't see who's on Zoom, but to the extent someone from the police department is there. What I'm curious about is, is there a list of X offenses in which the police department says, okay, if this happens there at the location, we are gonna sort of uh, go into action. And I'm curious if that type of conversation takes place. Council member, we do have a uh, deputy chief uh, Schroeder. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, Zoom, there he is, I think. Uh... Yes, uh, good evening. Councilperson, no, I, I heard your question. Um, so the, the, the simple answer to your question is no. I mean, it's all, it's really just based specifically on each individual um, incident um, and the circumstances at the time. There's no, there's no set types of crimes we, we respond to. Obviously, any crime of violence um, is something we would respond to, as you would know. But um, we often get, you know, I mean, with every encampment, it seems to be, there, there tends to be lots of calls about criminal activity, a lot of which are, are um, relatively minor in nature, which is a challenge for us, as you can imagine. Um, so we have to weigh each particular one we, we get with uh, the staffing we have at the time and, and the access we have to the encampment. So um, long way to answer your question would be no, we really don't have a set of um, circumstances in which would, would uh, automatically make us go to uh, to um, deal with a specific crime other than crimes of violence. 
Okay, yeah, I, I appreciate, appreciate that. that. And I know that it's a sensitive situation, right? I, I am, I suspect everyone up here is not, and the city staff is not interested in criminalizing people for being poor and living on the street, right? Obviously, we don't want that. And I suspect that that naturally, and I agree with it, that that plays into some of the decisions <laughs> as it relates to interacting with some of the folks there. Um, Part of the challenge though is, is I, and this is just me being very completely honest, that I hear in the community sometimes is, is, and this is just a made up scenario, but I hear something like this. Well, we saw X person doing this, clearly a violation of the law. We call the police and a particular officer shows up and he says, look, I can't do anything, our hands are tied, we can't touch them, we can't do anything. Um, and even sometimes implying that it's, it's, it's us that are preventing the police department from enforcing some of these laws. And, and it puts us in a particular, in a difficult situation, right? Because one, and, I, and it's a balancing act, as I think to, uh, I think council member uh, uh, Esparza's point is that trying to acknowledge obviously that we don't want to enforce these low petty crimes like stealing a bicycle, right? Which obviously is a crime, but I think we need to be thoughtful about how to do that. Uh, but at some point, I mean, that there are things that happen where I fear that that the police department may be standing down when maybe they should be standing up and enforcing some of these laws for, for the betterment of the folks in the encampment as well as the community. And so I'd be, I'm not expecting an answer, but I think that balance is, is very important. And although I, my heart breaks for the people on the street and we need to do everything possible and I try to do everything possible in my district, we also have an obligation to make sure that the residents that are housed in our, in our district, and this is sort of the push and pull, right, that I described to some of the advocates, is that I understand you don't want abatements, but I also have to balance that with some of the concerns from the housed residents, and, and that's the inherent struggle and the challenge. And, and so, um, you know, as, so that I'll stop there, but as an example, something that came up, because we were talking about fires, say, for example, we, we explore the buffer zone for further study on mobile homes, there's a gentleman up, a uh, up against the fence, lights a fire, certainly a, a fear that it's gonna catch one of the home mobile homes on fire. We send someone out from the housing department, whoever it may be, home first, goes out, tells him, hey dude, you can't be doing this. He keeps doing it. Does the police then get involved or we just say, well, he's refusing services, right? And so that, those are some of the things that I'm interested in exploring that I really think we need to take seriously. Um, and so, I just wanted to put that out there. I, I think it's sometimes often something we don't talk about because I understand it's a sensitive topic. I certainly don't want to say anything to make people think that I think all oh, folks living in these encampments are, 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 have, are criminals or are doing bad things. I think a lot of them are just surviving, which I think is very important and we need to facilitate that survival. Um, but in all honesty, there are some folks in there that are doing bad things. And so how do we weed those folks out? to figure out how we make the folks in the encampment safe as well as our residents safe. And so to the extent you haven't thought about that, I, I'd really like this, this, these statements to really prompt that because I think that's, a, that's an important section of this that we often don't touch on, but I think is a very important to say. Thank you. Councilmember Sparson. Thank you, Mayor. I, I actually forgot something on my list um, and that was to uh, have a little, hear a little bit more about capacity. Um, I did look at the timelines for hiring. Um, and so, you know, I'm guessing, right, January, we'll have people, 28, knock on wood, 28 people um, in, in new jobs. Um, and I, I support the idea, I, I love like the idea of somebody coming in out of the Resilience Corps and um, being able to come into a, a city, you know, job, hopefully a future career for them. Um, but I, I'm really concerned about capacity. And, and, and I'll, uh, Council Member Perales brought up Guadalupe Gardens, and um, it was clear to me that, you know, all the work that we've done on that has pulled resources from the rest of the city. And so I'm concerned about how we are going to move forward, how we're going to address the next few months, um, and is how we're going to address the next few months and some of this planning, and how you can be more explicit about our capacity limitations to us. Well, last week I tried. 
<laughs> I'm joking a little, but it, it was a lot, you know, a lot of different nuances. Um, you know, we do try in, in, in these, and I, I think the recommendations today, you know, with the exception of, of the one Reagan was talking about, but now modified, these are all reasonable things, I think, for us to pursue. Truthfully, though, we are building the plane while flying it still. Um, hopefully, you know, by January in that first quarter, we really start to hit our stride. That's our expectation, is that you start to truly see once a week trash service and what that can look like around the city, and you will see a more visually clean city. That's our goal. Um, but yes, the more layers we add, the more complicated it gets and the less capacity we have. And so those are some of the things we talked about today and how we're trying to manage those. For example, add a team that's specifically the team that works with other agencies, right? Caltrans, UPR, Valley Water, because those tend to be very difficult encampments. They tend to be big, lots of weight that we gotta remove, lots of people sometimes, structures and things like that. They could take the entire week and a whole crew. And that means no trash service forever, forever. We're ignoring that week because of that. But we set us, we want to set aside this independent team so that it doesn't take away from anything else. And I think we'll talk more about that next week um, in the ARP funding because that's what we're targeting for that. Dumpster days, you were mentioning them. Um, you know, we're asking to add a lot more money for dumpster days so that we can engage the community more um, in helping clean up the community. So I do think that 2022 is going to be a much cleaner year for us. Um, you know, I think I mentioned the program was born on July 1st of this year, so, you know, we're just getting going, teaching it to walk, we're getting it out of diapers, um, you know, we're on our way. Um, so I think that first quarter, you're gonna start seeing the difference of these investments that you've been proving and making. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we're lagging a little bit on the, and the, the hiring stuff. Um, but we have, you know, I think we, we feel very positive that we will be able to handle what we're expected to do right now. Now, when we come back in April and talk to you about, what well, do you wanna do setbacks along creeks? That's a whole nother pot of work, right? <laughs> so, and even, even the mobile home parks and doing the setbacks, that's a lot of work. And we've had good conversations with the fire department, sort of what would that look like and how would we do it? Because, you know, they've said to us, this is alarming to us when someone's right up against a, a mobile home park and they're, they're lighting fires. Um, and, and I know you all know the dangers of, of fires in mobile home parks is extreme. Um, so, but that's gonna take resources and we're gonna tell you when we come back, we're not gonna say in, in cases like that, we're not gonna be in a position to say, well, we'll just take that on and absorb it. We're not gonna be able to do two big ones like that. Around the hospitals, easy enough. There's not that many hospitals, there's not that many people in camp that close to them. Those are, that's low hanging fruit, things like that. But some of those bigger ticket setbacks that we're gonna consider, we're gonna have to have a pretty frank conversation about it when we're back here in April. Okay, thank you. And can I just add okay. one more thing? I'm sorry, just we do think that the flexibility to add capacity will be greatly helped by increasing our funding for vendors, right? We, we work in partnership with Tucker and HCI. They've been great. Uh, we also have a Goodwill Conservation Corps. So as we continue to, um, well, put forward additional funding that you'll consider uh, next week, but that gives us greater flexibility as we wait to bring on staff. Okay. Thank you, um, that's helpful. Um, and thank you, John, for bringing up the whole setback and fires. I know Council Members Foley and Jimenez brought it up. Um, I think all of us have had residents, I mean, I've had residents in single family homes that have lost fences because of an encampment fire next to their home. That's scary. And, and we've shown photos of mobile home parks and mobile home parks are especially terrifying because they only have a short time to get out before it burns down. Um, and I think that's also an, an opportunity where we can explore more with Union Pacific. Um, I have a lot of mobile home parks in my district and some of those have are next to Union Pacific land and they're those weird little slivers um, that they don't necessarily always like taking responsibility for. So there are these little no man's land with no security, no limited to no fencing. Um, so there's an opportunity maybe for us to pursue securing those parcels or selling them to a nearby property owner so that they can secure them, i.e. the mobile home parks, right? Um, that way we're just not in this vicious cycle of abating these weird slivers of land or having fires um, at 
some of these fences next to mobile home parks because it's really really scary when you see the flames shooting up over you know higher than a home um that's terrifying um okay that's it for me thank you thank you councilman Hernandez. just a quick question so so you know i, I i'm embarrassed i don't know this but um, and I suspect it's Tucker, but uh, when we want to get to once per week, right, picking up the garbage, is it one of the contractors such as Tucker that goes out and cleans up the garbage? Is it? Yes, we'll be using, we have two, um, we actually have four vendors, and we'll be using a combination of all four of those as we transition into one time per week service. Right. Uh, you know, I can't help but think that when we mention one time per week, I think about my own garbage service, our own. <laughs> and so what I'm thinking is, have we ever, and maybe you've already done this, but anyway, something that came to mind is, maybe exploring the possibility of adding it to the existing routes for the city haulers. And I'm curious if there would be some efficiencies been into that. But <laughs> I'm just, I'm serious. I mean, yeah, no, it's a good yeah, funny you so, should ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have, you know, it, you know, obviously ESD manages the garbage contracts for the city and they're huge. They're hu I think they're, I think I've been told they're some the biggest in the country um, in terms of the cost, but I could be wrong. But the, the issue really comes down to the fee that they collect in order to pay for that service. And there's legal interpretation that says that fee has to directly serve the fee payer, right? So if I'm taken from that fee and I'm using it on someone that doesn't have an address and can't be billed and isn't paying into the system, I'm not allowed to use that money to clean up. They couldn't really theoretically just build the city of San Jose and we be the payer of that fee? I don't, do. I don't know yeah. how that would work, Nora. I don't know if you have an opinion on it. Any, yeah. yeah no, no, no. We can look at that. That that may very well. I don't work. expect we're going to solve this here, but anyway, I wanted to point that out because it reminds me of, you know, if they have plotted locations throughout the city. We're going to do this pickup at this location, at this Cloverleaf, and they're already with the trucks, and it seems to me it makes sense to just pick it up. But We anyhow. do have a pilot site in mind to consider something like District that. District 2? Uh, <laughs> no. Kind yeah. of. Close, I guess it's close. <laughs> District South. Um, but we have considered that in terms of uh, for dumpsters or for other yeah. services where it doesn't make sense for us. We can't go in for whatever reason. Yeah. And I'd be so curious of the cost, right, of having mm -hmm. these different vendors as opposed to just adding it to this massive contracts that we have that we, I don't know if we amortize them over 30 years, whatever it is, right? And so, anyway, thank you. I really want to embrace Councilor Armanez's suggestion because uh, let's face it, a lot of this is as people who are living in public space, we are the public agency, maybe not for all of that land, but for an awful lot of it. And it seems to me that we could be putting disposal locations in city locations and be the rate payer. Um, I'd like to believe, you know, there may well be efficiencies. I mean, Lord knows we're having a hard time hiring and it's, a, it's, it's brutally hard work and having a company that already has the equipment, gosh. So I, I really appreciate that suggestion. I know it's hard to explore all these ideas at the same time we're up to our knees and alligators, but if there's anything we can do to help nudge our friends over in the, in the waste hauling business to explore it, we'd, I'd certainly be enthusiastic about it. Uh, Angel, I'm sorry, it looked like you were about to jump in. I know. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, great. Uh, I want to also just give, I know we did talk a little bit about illegal dumping. I know it's not directly in the middle of this, but uh, I want to give mad props to the rapid response teams because uh, those folks work incredibly hard. I was out with them a couple of Saturdays ago and uh, we were running around the Washington Guadalupe neighborhood and literally it's it's one guy per truck and these are enormous sofas. I don't know how the heck they're getting them in these trucks. Uh, I have no idea, they're superhuman, but, um, but yeah, I appreciate their really hard work. Um, I, I noticed that the positions that we're hiring for, for Andrea, that you, you mentioned, several of them had already closed uh, on the hiring. And how hard is it for us just to sort of reopen that, uh, turn on the switch again, um, if we're not getting enough? I don't think it's very hard. They closed yesterday. Yeah. So we should be hearing in terms of the pool. Okay. Um, but I, I just do want to give a, a big thank you to OER and Cheryl Parkman and her team that have really stepped up. And I think we are going to be in partnership with them for a while. So I, yeah. I don't think it would be hard to open it back up. If we okay. To. Well, if you've got lots of candidates, great. If not, I'm happy to, I was just going to try to tweet out uh, a message Please do. or something. Yeah. Please do. Don't stop. <laughs> yeah. So just let me know where to send it. No, okay. we'll do it. Um, 
I thought Councilor Jimenez raised another really important but really difficult to discuss issue, um, which is, that, you know, we should never, ever, ever criminalize homelessness, and we should always be absolutely committed to supporting our unhoused neighbors and, and getting on their feet um, and, and getting them housed. But we also know that the, the unhoused are disproportionately victims of crime, and particularly violent crime, and we know they're vi victimized a lot by others who are out there. Um, and I, I think we have to accept the reality, uh, which I know is anathema to some, which is that we're going to have police officers in encampments, just like we have police officers in neighborhoods. And uh, it's, it's going to be necessary for a variety of reasons, but I can tell you, I remember going on one walk along with the, the street crimes team, and the first tent we approached, um, you know, there were some meth pipes out in front, and so obviously it gave the officers a reason to say, hey, you guys, you know, what's going on? You can't use this stuff. You know, there wasn't going to be any arrest. He was going to seize the pipes because you're not going to get anybody, you know, in jail or anything for that. But, you know, they ran the, the warrants on these two guys who were in this large tent structure, and there were two women there too, and they both had warrants out for felony domestic violence. Um, and so, you know, they picked them up on the warrants. Um, these guys were, you know, failed to appear, obviously, for the, their criminal court cases. You know, there are those situations, and I think in that case, the officers probably saved somebody from being abused. And so I just think, you know, we, we have to be pragmatic and realistic about, it, about the, the horrible dangers that our in-house are facing out there. And, and as difficult as it may be for us to talk about police being out there, I think that's the reality. Um, and I know our police are not thrilled about doing this, um, but, but it's important. Um, really appreciate all the discussion. I really appreciate, Andrea, what you said about how we're going to be shifting, it looks like, from outputs to outcomes. Um, I, I know you've probably heard me preach enough about that. I, I, I just, I know we're doing a lot of work, but the most important thing is, you know, what's happening for the unhoused and what's happening for the rest of the residents um, who are observing all of this and, and I think really understanding outcomes from that perspective is going to be so important um, and it'll help us improve. Um, I, I know it's on page seven, there was some discussion around the mental health and substance abuse challenges um, that, that obviously our, our teams are, are encountering and so are the nonprofit teams are doing outreach. And it says, there's a pain point in our service work plan that's a priority to resolve. And I want to just get a sense from you about how, I know the county's likely stretched on resources too, but how has the county been responding um, to the city's expression of, hey, this is a real pain point for us? Can I ask a clarifying, are you talking about specific individual cases or just in general? Um, I guess more in general, like uh, in terms of, you know, are we able to get somebody into a detox center? Are we able to get somebody into treatment? Are we able to get... I can <laughs> start. <laughs> so I think that the county faces uh, some similar challenges in terms of not having enough, let's say, detox beds to, to, to meet the need. Uh, similar to we don't have enough housing units to meet the need. Um, but I will say that um, the county's responsive to requests, I'll just, I'll give heading and spring as an example. When we said we need an all hands on deck approach to heading and spring and we need behavioral health at the table, um, they said absolutely and they're there with us every week uh, and they've created a sort of backdoor kind of referral system and we're case conferencing and sharing information about clients and they're going out to work with specific individuals uh, that we've identified need their assistance. So, um, I, so I guess um, my experience is there's still work to be done. They still have their challenges with 
resources and not enough beds. Um, but when we do ask for assistance, you know, they, they do their best. I think it's still challenging for some specific encampments. You know, we may, we encounter instances where um, someone, an individual is certainly looks like they're a, a harm to themselves, whether right. they're- They're having an episode. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's in that moment that's, I think, a little more difficult to find a solution. Although I will say the mobile crisis response team, uh, which is somewhat new, right. should help us in those sort of immediate crisis situations. And that's the partnership with County Mental Health and the police. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know. If but thank you. Colleagues yeah. want to add yeah. anything. I just wanted to yeah. say I, I think we're in a, a series of kind of deeper seek to understand conversations with them, especially around as they're contemplating their. Um, implementation of Laura's law, assisted outpatient treatment, re really trying to strengthen, like I said, the warmer handoff. Because yeah. right now, um, it's great that we have a backdoor line for Guadalupe Gardens, but what about, you know, Reinhardt? What about, you know, so yeah. all the other 220 that, that we kind of have in our in our mind um, that are that are severe. Not all 220 need this, but um, so we are, we're, Together, we're, we're going to figure this out, and um, again, that's a part of the workflow and coordination, um, and kind of constant conversation that we need to be having with the county. Thank you, I appreciate that, and I, you know, I, I do. I, I, I'm mindful of the fact that county has challenges and limitations, um, as every county does. Uh, I'm not super optimistic that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to fit in the. Um, in the legal uh, framework that Laura's Law is going to enable us to really help get into treatment or civil commitment or anything um, that will enable them to get services just based on what we've seen in other counties. It's a really small number of folks. What I'm hoping is that this conversation can progress to really focus on what seems to be driving an enormous number of what we perceive as mental health episodes, which seems, seems to be very high correlated to methamphetamine use and finding ways. Um, and, you know, I've been spending time with the county. We've gone through the sobering station with folks and, you know, it's just not a great answer uh, for methamphetamine use because we know there's often uh, unpredictable and often violent behaviors associated with that. So you just, you can't use a typical sobering station. Um, but I'm hopeful that we can find a better path um, that'll enable us to address what I think we're seeing, not just here, but certainly in LA, in Phoenix, a lot of big Southwest cities, which is just a huge scourge of, of meth use out on the street that seems to be getting worse because the meth itself has changed and the behavior is, is even more challenging. And so anyway, I, I appreciate it's tough out there. Um, for everybody who's trying to do this work, and it's even tougher for folks who are living out there. So um, thank you for the work you're doing, and I look forward to continuing to uh, find ways to get resources to, to support you. All right, we've got a motion. Thanks to all my colleagues for their dialogue. Let's vote. Jimenez? Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Aye. Okay, we got time for open forum. Blair Beekman? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, thanks for the meeting today. Thanks for all the work on this item. You know, to try to clarify my words uh, from the previous item, some of my words, um, you know, uh, we're, we're going through a lot of new things right now with uh, the subsidy money involved uh, with, with that can help with housing programs and new council persons uh, working on the efforts. I hope, you know, our tra more traditional progressive uh, uh, housing activist community will want to uh, get involved with these uh, new things that are happening. Uh, they can offer some real guidance and help, I think, uh, responsible help. We need 
all sorts of help <laughs> with these sorts of things. And, uh, you know, it's, it's um, the, to, to address the future of subsidies needs a lot of responsible uh, guidance as well. So thank you. Um, I, there was a few other things I, I wanted to mention at, at this time. Um, I, I've written to yourselves about my, uh, I, I've been talking so much about uh, earthquake stuff over the past six months that I, I hope I can begin to talk to yourselves uh, on a personal individual level to get some sort of sense how we can have a more uh, responsible and mature conversation, how I can talk about uh, these sort of subjects in our future. The planning of these things, uh, of these issues, uh, how do we talk about planning? How do we make that an open conversation for everyone to understand how do we plan for the next year compared to the next few years? You know, if we learn a language, I think we can learn a better, more open language to discuss that. And, and so everyone's more clear about how we talk about things. I, I need some help with that. And I would, would like some about the future of emergency preparedness ideas. Thank you. Um, with 20, 19 seconds left. Um, Oh, a big meeting coming up about the future of the city charter. Pro I mean, yeah, the city charter process. I hope there can be ways we can consider a future of a study session process into the uh, beginning of 2022. Thanks. A gold tough. A gold T H A. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you, members. I've just popped in because I'm, I live at the California Renaissance townhomes and I'm uh, speaking up about the 71 Vista Montana parking lot. It's, there's no, uh, we, we're not getting any resolution. We're not getting acknowledged for our efforts in trying to communicate with uh, the council members. Uh, the uh, last uh, week, we had an introduction to the city manager, but we only one person was able to speak. I feel like you guys are trying to ignore us. And as residents, a longtime resident, I'm concerned about the, the lack of security for our neighborhood when uh, there's security inside by with one guard and then there's only, but it, you're not creating the security outside that fenced area. And there's a lot of activity outside of that fenced area because these people have friends that are coming and they're parking on our streets and they're coming to um, to meet with these people. We have no idea what's going on. There doesn't seem to be oversight. It seems that uh, the, the funds that you, you must have received uh, for only like two porta potties for the residents that are on an arsenic ridden uh, landfill of, uh, and you're putting people on there to live which is the city itself deemed it uninhabitable last year. I feel like I'm con consistently repeating myself. However, until you guys actually pay attention that it's, it's a dangerous site for all the residents, not only in it, but outside of, the, outside of that uh, lot, it, you've just put our community in danger. And it doesn't make sense to me that our officials would do that. Thank you. Caller 5140. This last caller is exactly what I'm talking about. Dereliction of duty by the city and the police officers of San Jose. You guys let everybody else break the rules. These people have special privileges. Somebody who's got money or a car that with registration and an address, you people have no problem ticketing it, towing it, harassing the driver. Got no problems doing that. You guys should be ashamed of yourselves for what you do what you do to the average citizen. This poor woman, I've heard her call in before. You guys just poo 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 her, man. You probably turn your cameras off and laugh. I think you guys think this is all funny. Because what else could it be? I mean, really, you're gonna let these people do whatever they want. Hey, they don't want to pay the fine, then they go to jail. Because if I went to court and I don't pay my fine, you know what the judge is gonna do? He's gonna throw me in the slammer or he's going to put a bench warrant out for me. And he and I'm going to tell you something. Your officers will put me in jail gladly, especially if they know who I am. I mean, they they've treated me badly when they didn't know who I was. But you got you you guys need to do some soul searching, man. You're letting you're you're allowing people to break the rules and don't have them. 
get rid of the laws. I mean, Pam and, and Sam, they love regulations for homeowners, you know, the flagpoles, the sheds, the fences. You guys love to make someone tear a fence down or a flagpole that's too high. But, hey, you park your car somewhere and have it full of junk and, and, and uh, defecate outside, that's okay. You want to shoot heroin, that's okay. You want to snort meth, that's okay. You want to have an open container? You're not going to get the $1,250 fine for that if you're homeless. You're going to get to walk. Caller 6910. Hi. Um, I actually wanted to make a couple of comments. One of them is uh, regarding Vista Montana. Um, I cannot imagine how much good could be done in this world if all of those people actually got together to affect some real positive change for unhoused people instead of calling in like scared little ninnies making up crazy stories about unhoused people. I also wanted to address another issue uh, regarding um, the unhoused folks. Um, earlier today, it was brought up about crime and mess. Uh, Dr. Jordan, in her study about unhoused deaths, pointed out that in 2011 to 2013, the unhoused meth death rate went up 300%. Nobody responded to that. Nobody created an emergency. And now you're like, wow, meth is a problem. Um, this isn't breaking news. And if we don't address that and create it, and address it like a real issue, create more treatment centers, uh, create more THUs, um, and more places for people to actually go once they get out of a THU rather than a shelter or the streets, it will, become, it will be an ongoing problem. There needs to be more action from the city and state to address this, and maybe the caller before me could get off alcohol and stop calling in. He's just bitter. Thanks. Back to the chair. Okay, okay, wait, 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 wait,